And, but we're just so thankful you're keeping going faithfully for the Lord. And that's a great blessing. Great to be here again. I think it's about the third time or fourth time we've been here over the, I don't know, how many years ago? How many? Three times. Three times including today. Okay. Anyway, but that's good. And so um, great to, to be with you today. The Lord bless you there. I do... Um, I did bring some of my own personal books, they're not to take away, but they're just to look at there. So sometimes people say, well, would you recommend any books to read? And I just bought some that uh, you might want to take a note of there. I think um, uh, they put them out somewhere there. So here we are. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So, so that's great. Well, we'll thank the Lord for that. And we just pray God's blessing there. Now, just a, a few things I'd like to say in, in introduction here. Uh, this... Um, <clears throat> This is original King James uh, uh, Bible. You know, often people say that um, King James uses Elizabethan English. It's the other way round. It's the King James Version that formulated our modern English. And, you know, that's important. If you look in the, uh, the, the beginning of the original where it says translators to the readers there, it reads completely different to what you actually find in the Bible. Uh, that because that was the way they spoke then. So the Bible is its own language there. The Bible defines our language as a as a as a King James Bible there. So um, that's why it's so important. It's the most readable Bible. It's the most easy to remember, and uh, there's no question about that. But that in itself uh, isn't um, uh, sufficient. We've got so much more to present here. Why we use the King James Bible? Because actually, what we're defending, we're defending how God preserved the Hebrew and a few. Uh, parts of Aramaic in the Old Testament and the Greek in the New Testament. So we call that the, uh, the Masoretic in the Old Testament and the, the Texas or Sexus or the TR uh, in the New Testament, the original languages. And God has preserved those and so uh, they've been translated uh, accurately then. Uh, that's faithful. But they're not being translated accurately today because people have come out with new, uh, in the last hundred or so years, they've come out with new manuscripts and so on, just a handful of them. Uh, that uh, divert from the, the massive witness of, of the, the text behind the King James. So we're going to be explaining all of that and uh, showing you some pictures and so on. But just some more things I'd like to say here, uh, just to give you an idea of what's, uh, uh, what uh, is going on here. But this is kind of interesting. I just picked this up um, off the radio one time, actually. But um, it says that English classical music composer Dame Ethel Mary Smythe 1858 to 1944. She was born in Sidcup and died in Woking. Uh, she was an anticipating the premiere of one of her compositions in Leipzig, but uh, had stipulated that there should be absolutely no changes to the score that she'd written. However, when she looked on the score uh, of the, uh, on the, all the different, uh, what do you call them, music stands of the, of the, uh, uh, the orchestra there. So when she looked on the score there, much had been changed and or omitted. And uh, her reaction was this, to remove all the music scores from the orchestra's stands and move on to Prague where the premiere was performed. And so <laughs> no one has the right to change, omit or add to the author's work without their permission. Yeah, it's so important. And it's even more important with God's holy word there. So it's important to recognize that. Now, uh, the... Um, <coughs> The interesting thing is, so let me just uh, mention this also here, this, um, which I, I always like to bring this because it, um, it shows you how uh, important it is to recognize what's going on uh, theologically uh, with, the, with the churches here. So um, uh, here we have it um, uh, in here. Uh, it talks about the Bible here. And <clears throat> this is an adult confirmation book from the Church of England. It was written by R.S. Wilkinson, and it has an imprimatur of a bishop there, uh, and the Bishop of Gloucester, I think, uh, yeah. And um, it talks about some wrong ideas about the Bible. Now it says this, what we have to understand is that the Old Testament was written by all very ordinary people who lived between two and 3,000 years ago, people who had a very limited knowledge and many of them simple and imperfect ideas about God. Then he goes on to say, um, part of the Old Testament is a history of these people. There is no doubt that the early part of their history was not written down until years after, some of its centuries after the events happened. Now, 
uh, we could qualify that because Moses probably wrote in 1400 or so BC uh, and of course he would have included material from Adam and so on that had been passed down and then, uh, there would have been other writings and so on uh, and the Bible talks about other books that were, were written, Jesu and so on. So uh, we need to be mindful of that but <laughs> they're going far beyond this. He said um, one of the first parts of the Old Testament written down was the Ten Commandments by Moses. It says, in the course of hundreds of years, all the many other laws which were found in the first books of the Old Testament were added. Now, there's 613 laws, and they're all given at the same time. It wasn't after many years. I mean, this is horrendous. And then it's got legends and folk tales here. So it's handed down by word of mouth and not written at first were many old tales which were made up to explain things which they did not understand. And it goes on, so there grew up the folk tale of Noah building the ark. And then it says, and saving two of every animal. He says, we know better now, and we do not need this explanation. See, the problem is, you see, mankind has become very egotistical and arrogant, and, you know, we think we know better there, we think that we've learned so much. You know, actual fact, there's so much from ancient cultures that we've lost, actually, uh, rather than, so technologically, uh, we've gone forward there, uh, but um, uh, intellectually, uh, no. Uh, Adam was probably the most intellectual and brilliant man they ever created, and then we've gone down from there. Okay, so um, so it grew up the, the no tale of, of Noah. Then it says so they grew up the tale of the Tower of Babel. So another one there. It says the same thing is true about the account of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It says so the Jews took this tale and put it in their book. But the wonderful thing, wonderful thing, is that they took out all of it, all its heathen coarseness and turned it into a tale with sublime thoughts, wonderfully simply expressed. Isn't that sad? And then they go on to say um, uh, about what happened with Samuel and uh, killing the Amalekites. It says Samuel thought this was what God wanted and so on. So it goes on in that vein and there's all sorts of other things in here and there's even reference to Mary worship. So obviously a very Anglo-Catholic uh, there. Just, uh, but... Um, uh, People are accommodating this merry worship these days and so on. But we, we have to take a stand. Now, um, <clears throat> let me uh, move that down a bit. Okay. That will help. Okay, good. All right, fine. Uh, can you hear me? So, okay, that's good. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, do we have a clicker? Okay, good. So, um, let's, um, let's start on through here and we'll explain some things as we go through. Okay, we walk by faith, not by sight. If we just refer to the fact of the intellectualism of the day. Now, we're all for studying and, and uh, learning and growing and maturing, and of course we're told to uh, study to show, to show ourselves approved under God, a workman and so on. Uh, what we need is, um, but what we need is Bible theology, not uh, uh, man-constructed uh, theology. That's what we need. Uh, and so we must formulate all of our our studies around the Bible there. We don't uh, take what we know now and read it into the Bible. We take what the Bible says and, and then we ap apply that now. And that's important that we, we do that. So, but we walk by faith, not by sight. And so we, what we have nowadays is uh, so-called science there. So we've got, to, we've got to prove everything. Well, they can't prove hardly anything, but, uh, but you know, they certainly can't prove evolution. <laughs> uh, but um, it's important that we recognize that. So when we come to the Bible, we're treading on unique territory because it's the word of God there and when I was saved I, uh, I, I just astonished how I just suddenly the Bible opened up after I became a Christian and dwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and, and the natural man understandeth not the things of the spiritual God the spiritual God no they can know them they're foolish it's unto it says there in Corinthians and so it's important to to recognize that and so um, uh, let's not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. And so it's important that we recognize that. Now, if we come through the next um, uh, slides here. Okay, <clears throat> key issue involved in the textual debate here. Okay, does the Bible teach preservation of every word given by inspiration of God, or does it teach the preservation of the message only? There are technical terms that people use for uh, these things. Uh, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, they, the, but the basic idea is that they're saying today, well, God has preferred his word, yes, but not every single letter, not every single, and certainly not the vowel points. Now, when I <clears throat> was first taught uh, theology, 
I was taught that uh, the vowel points were lost in the Old Testament and they were reinserted by the Masoretes, uh, Jewish scribes, in 600 years after Christ. Uh, and um, now, you know, that's the academic stance of most even conservative evangelicals today. But that is incorrect because, you know, God preserved those veil points and he preserved the accent, the musical notations and things and so on. So, you know, because every jot and tittle is uh, going to be preserved there. So um, that's important that we recognize that. Uh, so um, uh, just uh, a, little, a little dot there, a full stop or period, you call it there, and would be, uh, would be um, uh, Shirek in the Old Testament or Korea in the New Testament there but a little that's a little one little dot there and so on and so uh, some of the vowel points instead of having letters like we do they have they, they have uh, dots and, and lines and so on uh, in the in the Hebrew but 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 you know you can't have you can't have um, uh, language without vowels now they say well you the Washington Post it doesn't have vowels in it in Israel today and so on. Well, you can, yeah, you can get the gist of it, but it, 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 it fails in accuracy at paces there. And it's important there because when God says, write down what I've said, God actually spoke words. And when he spoke words, he has to speak vowels and consonants. You can't speak without vowels and consonants. And so God spoke these words and they had to be recorded exactly as he said. And so uh, if God didn't preserve those, then uh, that, that makes nonsense because you know God actually said these words. So uh, if you were to take out the vowels of what I'm saying today and you put that down there, I mean you wouldn't make any head or tail of it and so on. So yes, you may be able to cert recognize certain words there from the from the from the uh, uh, the consonants there in, in, the, in the Washington Post or whatever there, but there's no way you can get down as accurate as you need to, to to put across the word of god so just some interesting thoughts here so if we move on here uh and um <clears throat> so we've got the preservation of the hebrew vowel points all right now uh, exodus 6 3 talks about but my name jehovah was i not known unto them jehovah all right so that's the uh the, the hebrew verb to be jehovah and um <clears throat> in isaiah 26 4 the lord jehovah there mentions and then uh, modern version then they all have the lord instead of jehovah in these verses why is that uh, the claims of modern scholarship have influenced this i believe so if we move on uh here it's a question here oh that's that's gone wrong i don't know what's uh, happened here but um uh oh um all right we've got a problem with technical here uh okay um all right <clears throat> Well, we can't do much about that. What we have here is um, <clears throat> uh, it's basically what we want to look at here. This is the Hebrew. Uh, this is, I don't know where this has come from. But I, I get this problem when I try things at home. But this is the Hebrew there without the vowel points, the dots and so on. Uh, it should have been with the vowel points up here and so on. So with the vowel points, you can't get anything else other than Jehovah. Okay, but that, but with the without the vowel points, they come up with Yahweh. So um, any any time they refer to Yahweh, I reject it. I reject it. It's Jehovah, uh, and that's the that's the pre the key issue here. So uh, this is really just not you know academic arguments. This is down to the very very core. Uh, can you trust God to preserve His word as He's promised or not? And, and so it's important to recognize that. So if we move on, I'll have to get corrected here. Now, Museum of the Bible, this is in Washington, D.C. Uh, I haven't actually been there, but I just took this picture off the uh, uh, internet there. But um, uh, So this is an incredible uh, m uh, museum they put up there. But, uh, I mean, obviously there's going to be things that we're not going to agree with there uh, because it would follow the modern uh, text and so on. But, uh, interestingly enough, we move on, uh, we have here... And in, in that, they have an exhibit of the Slaves Bible, uh, back from the early sort of 18, 1900, whatever, but there uh, in, the, um, in America. Uh, and so it says parts of the Holy Bible for sure, but of the 1,189 chapters of the Authorized Version, only 232 remain. 
so 90% of the Old Testament and 50% of the New Testament removed. But this, this is, uh, they wanted to give this, these scriptures to the, to the slaves, but not the rest of it. So you have things like, you know, after 50 years, you've got to let all the slaves go. Uh, you've got to have things, and, uh, you know, there's not a bond or free or whatever in the New Testament and so on. That's all missing. And so they wouldn't dare let the slaves get hold of that and so on. Uh, now, you know, this isn't directly um, uh, affecting what we're going to be talking about here, but it does illustrate here how people use or misuse the Bible or selectively use the Bible there uh, and how the culture can influence people there and how people's academic um, opinions can, can, uh, can get involved in all of these things. So we have to be aware of this here. So we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, if we move on here, the New English Bible. This is interesting. Um, <clears throat> now, when um, uh, I have a, this is a copy of what I have at home. And if we move on to the next slide there, uh, in London, where I was born, I went to the Boys Brigade there, and it's an organisation they have. It's started by William Alexander Smith in Glasgow in 1883, I think. Uh, anyway, but it's a uniform sort of boys' organisation. This was in a Baptist church in, in London I went to. So it was just private deals, more and so on. So that's 1961-62, so I was, I was at 14, 14 years old. Uh, and, uh, and they gave me a copy of the New King James. I haven't got it with me today. So the, sorry, the New English Bible. Now, the New English Bible uh, there, uh, I had also a copy of the authorised version. Now, when I was 15 or 16, 17, as a teenager, I read the authorised version through cover to cover, every word. I wasn't a Christian. And I read the New Testament twice. Didn't understand it, but I was seeking. But I had this Bible here, but I never touched it. I never read it. It just didn't seem right. Even as an unsaved person, it didn't seem right. You know, interesting. Uh, so, uh, let me just um, read here the churches involved in approving of this. It was actually the Church of Scotland uh, that actually sort of really put this forward, but also involved in it with the Baptist Union of Great Britain and Ireland, Church of England, Church of Scotland, Congregational Church of England and Wales, Council of Churches for Wales, Irish Council of Churches, the London Yearly Society, of the, the French Society of Friends, that's the Quakers, uh, and uh, the Methodist Church of Great Britain, the Presbyterian Church of England, the British and Foreign Bible Society, the National Bible Society for Scotland, and the Catholics also had representatives there. Uh, and uh, just to mention the, the plethora there, there's a lot of queer fish swimming around in that pond. Uh, and so um, just, um, uh, okay. So let's look at the New King James Bible as opposed to the uh, the authorised version or the King James Version here. So, okay, Isaiah 53, verse 3, it says he was despised and rejected of men, all right? Becomes, in this New English Bible, he was despised, he shrank from the sight of men. He never shrank from the sight of anybody. Uh, that's some incredible. Uh, I mean, that is just heretical, I would say, uh, would you not? Heretical. Okay, now, in, in I, the 54... Uh, 50, verse 4b, we did extremely smitten of God and afflicted the KJV becomes, we counted him smitten of God, struck down by disease and misery. This is, this is supposed to be for young people to learn easier. Struck down by disease and misery. Uh, <laughs> he was the perfect son of God, although he could die, he gave up the ghost himself actually, but, but uh, nevertheless uh, he could not get ill and have disease and so on, he'd get tired and, and hungry and thirsty and whatever, but uh, there's no way, uh, because he was not affected by the curse, <laughs> so he didn't have a human father. Okay, so, uh, but um, th that is theologically horrendous. Well, we carry on, uh, Isaiah 53 verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death becomes... He was assigned a grave with the wicked, a burial place among the refuse of mankind. Well, he was buried amongst the, he was buried in a rich man's tomb, you see. And so this is again highly inaccurate, and um, uh, you can see how the kind of emotion bit, the, the sentimental bits coming in here. Uh, they're trying to sort of create a well, he's a nice guy, and he does, you know, I mean. Uh, it just removes all about the holiness of Christ and, and everything else and so on. It, uh, it's incredible, but uh, okay, carry on here. They pierced my hands and my feet, became the hacked off my hands and my feet. 
hacked off. Now, if we look at John 19.36, it says, For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. You can't hack off somebody's hands and feet without breaking a bone. Uh, I mean, that is unbelievable. Where did they, that is not even a, a taking the, um, uh, the original language and translating it there. It's, it's, it's abusing it there. It's perverting it there. It's massacring the original language. Okay, so we carry on again. And then Luke 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And it just uh, says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God is missing. Well, you know, you, you, could, you might imply that or infer it there, but it's certainly not, uh, uh, not accurate there, is it? It's ridiculous. So we move on again. Uh, and then Genesis 3.15, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy kid, and thou shalt bruise his heel, becomes uh, they strike at your head, and you shall strike at their heel, and so on. So again, uh, that um, uh, is a lot different to, uh, or far less um, dramatic than, than what we find in the uh, inaccurate there. Okay, murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers become patricides and matricides. Is that easier? Uh, that's supposed to be easier. <laughs> okay, we'll give some more examples later on of how things are supposed to be easier with these things. Okay, so right, okay, so commanding to abstain from meats, it becomes inculcating abstinence from certain foods. That's nice and simple. Uh, so <laughs> uh, this is make it easier for children to read. <laughs> now, this was given to me by the captain there, Captain Philip Rose, a lovely man, loved the Lord, godly man. He just didn't know anything about these things and so on. I mean, uh, probably had never read it. They just recommended this, and you know, so many people today they just they just go because somebody's recommended, or they got a big name, or they got loads of doctorates off their names, or whatever, uh, and because of that, well, they must be right. Uh, don't believe it. There, you know, I mean, I read about one case where somebody had quoted somebody, got quoted somebody, all these doctors quoted somebody else, and, and about six different lines there, and apparently the original person said exactly the opposite. Uh, and we need to be careful. <laughs> Uh, so, carry on then, I'll make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, becomes I'll make her a haunt for the busted, a waste of fen. Um, not sure what that means, but um, uh, nice and simple. <laughs> and, uh, just, uh, <laughs> all right. But it's not a laughing matter, is it? But you've got this whole, I mean, it's just what I've put a few pictures, all these different Bibles here, because uh, you get the, like good news from modern, that's a paraphrase there. Uh, and uh, so on. We'll explain more about some other things later on, but a paraphrase there is just sort of uh, just putting an interpretive uh, element into the, into the translation. Okay, so if we move on again. Okay, uh, this is uh, John Wycliffe. Here you can find this picture in Balliol College in Oxford. Uh, so that's where I took it there. I'm not sure you're allowed to anyway. I took the picture, but <laughs> so didn't say not to. So, <laughs> all right. So that's John Wycliffe. Now, back in the uh, 1350s or 13, mid, mid 14th century, there he produced an English version of the Bible, which he did a credible job. But it was from the Latin Vulgate translation, not from the Greek and the Hebrew, and so on. So that's important that we understand that. And so he did his best with what he had. And he, he was persecuted by the Catholic Church at that time and so on. And he certainly, his followers were bitterly persecuted. They were called Lollards or Babblers. It was an insulting name and so on. So um, as Baptists, we were, uh, it became, we were originally Anabaptists there, again Baptists. It was I mentioned a term of, of stigma and derogatory, really, to sort of these people. You know, that, that's, uh, but um, we're glad to receive the name anyway. But that's, uh, uh, so, okay, now, the uh, little bit of history here. And by the way, there's all these charts around there, I'll put around there from the Trinity Bible Society, but a uh, history of the translation of the Bible and then a, a history of, the, um, uh, of uh, the kind of church developments there and so on. So do, do have a look at these charts here. It kind of puts things in perspective. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> right. Uh, so, Johannes uh, Gutenberg then invented the printing press uh, with replaceable movable wooden or metal letters in 1436, completed in 1440. This method of printing could be credited not only for revolution of the production of books, but also for fostering rapid development in the sciences, arts, and religion through the transmission of text. All right, so this was a time when you're getting the renaissance, the renewal, 
and so on. And people, you see all these incredible paintings that people have done and so on, and Da Vinci and all these others and, and whatever. Uh, and, um, and then you see all these, um, these uh, works of art, so-called statues. Some of them are pretty gross. Uh, but um, uh, and these amazing buildings that they built and everything else like because there was a uh, there was this dark age of repression of the Catholic churches and so on east and west and so on but there's suddenly there's this renaissance came and uh, all of this brought about a lot of negative things but also about some positive things and so it's important to recognize that now so in 1453 Constantinople it's modern day uh, like uh, Istanbul or whatever there, so that's the capital of Turkey there, and, and uh, so um, uh, uh, it was captured by the Muslim hordes of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and this resulted in, the, in many scribes and scholars fleeing to the west, along with many Greek manuscripts. Notably, many of these were biblical manuscripts, so that's just fascinating, and so on. Now, the actual fact, the Greek uh, churches have actually retained more accurately the word of God than the original, than the, than the western churches. And, and so that's interesting. Now, there's no doubt that a providential, a providential occurrence uh, uh, that uh, impacted greatly on people's desire to read the Bible for themselves and consequently the need for the scripture to be available to the general populace in their own language. In order for this to happen, there needed to be accurate copies of the scriptures in the original languages. Thus began intense activity by gifted scholars to bring this to pass. So that's just a replica I took of, I saw it somewhere, this uh, Gottenberg Press. Uh, and. Uh, but just rev it's just revolutionized the whole thing there. I mean, hand copies took so long, so expensive, and so on. Uh, I mean, this just made things available, and so on. So, you, so it's fascinating how you get the, the, the printing press developed. Within a few years, uh, the, all these manuscripts came across from Constantinople because these people fled uh, from the Muslim hordes, and so on. There, there's providence involved here. <laughs> there's providence involved in this history, uh, and, you know, uh, we can't draw a line exactly and find out every little point there, but God has preserved his word, and you can certainly see providence happening here. From, and we're talking from an English perspective or British perspective today. Sorry, John. Uh, I Miss mean, Heinz 57 at the back there. He's, uh, so it kind of... Uh, but, <laughs> so, um, uh, all right. Uh, so carry on. Uh, so there's about 5,500 copies at the moment of uh, Greek New Testament texts. Uh, so that the New Testament is more problematical than the Old Testament, but there's still problems in the Old Testament. Uh, so, also, there were many more copies in the Latin, Italic, Syriac, Armenian, Georgian, Coptic, etc. Uh, there, and so um, uh, you find a Coptic there in Ethiopia and things like that, and, and uh, just astonishing things, really. Uh, and you even have different areas of Egypt there, the high, upper, middle and lower and so on, and the different dialects and so on, but all kinds of um, uh, manuscripts are available. And they have a certain value there because they're not Greek and they're not Hebrew, but they let you know what was actually uh, copied from at that time. Uh, and we'll talk more about this a little bit. Okay, so a little, little bit of the technical bit here. But uh, okay, so first new Greek Testament was published in... Um, uh, 1516, it was Desiderius Erasmus, a Greek, uh, sorry, a, a Dutch scholar uh, who was uh, eminent in Greek and, and the languages and so on. Uh, now, he was a Roman Catholic, but he, he um, actually um, he criticized the Catholics a lot. But, um, you know, many times, and, and I think if you look through some of these characters in history, even William Tyndale would talk about in a bit, you know, they didn't have anywhere else to go. I mean, they. They, they were born in that situation, they grew up in that situation, they realized things weren't right, they sought to change things, they sought to challenge things and so on. So there was a movement there uh, in the right direction there and some of them never came as far as they ought to have done or could have done but uh, had they lived longer maybe because some of them were martyred and cut off short and so on and it turned out to be the case of William Tyndale and so on. So we'll say more about that as we go on. Okay, so as we move through here, uh, so this was followed by a series of refinements and by other diligent uh, and um, motivated scholars commented with the labours of Theodore Beza, whose edition of 1598, I have a copy, I I've got it here, uh, uh, of our, our English authorised version is based, but uh, they're not massive changes here, they're just refinements. Uh, and one thing I, I need to point out too, is when the 1611 uh, translators, and we'll talk about them in a minute, but when they wrote their original 1611, they put in the margins there, the options they considered, right? Because you can translate a Greek word in different ways. For instance, so I see, 
uh, could be understand or whatever in the context of what you're using it. And so, so they put the, they they selected these these words that they wanted to put in there, but they also put the other options they considered, which were equally valid translations. There, you have to look at the context and so on. So, so that's interesting there. So um, that becomes very valuable. We might get onto it later on if we remember that that detail there. Now, so we move on here. Uh, and uh, William Tyndale then was the first person to translate the, and print uh, the Bible in English from the original languages there. Uh, he translated all of the New Testament and portions of the Old Testament, but was martyred before he finished his work. So his friend John Rogers, uh, who was also martyred, uh, completed the work after his death. Uh, so um, that's the opinion of William Tyndale. By the way, I got permission to show these pictures from most of the places that you're looking at here. Uh, so... Um, uh, all right, um, <clears throat> so we have a progression from Tyndale's New Testament, which is very, very good. I have a copy of it and so on. So it, it's, it's not hugely different to what we have today. Then the Geneva New Testament, that, was, um, that came on there. Again, the content of the actual text is pretty good. But the, um, and that was, by the way, the uh, Bible that the Pilgrim Fathers took to America in 1620 from, from, uh, from uh, Plymouth there. Uh, and, uh, but, um, <clears throat> uh, but the problem with that was it had Calvinistic footnotes. Uh, and so that was not acceptable to King James uh, there. And, um, but in 1611 then, uh, we have the uh, edition there. And what we have today is actually the 1769. Uh, but um, Dr. D.A. Waite, uh, he... Um, <clears throat> He and his wife listened to the entire New Testament from the 1611 and the 1769. And they found only 200 audible differences of, of little consequence. These are just refinements. So people like to try and say, well, we don't have the 1611. But basically we do, uh, you know, and uh, we call it ostensibly. So basically or realistically we do have it and so on. So when we say 1611 there, uh, the objections are really invalid there or they're grossly exaggerated and so on. So we need to be mindful of that. And so on. So, okay, so we move on here. And um, uh, this is a room in Edinburgh Castle in Scotland there. And uh, anybody been there? Uh, so, okay, okay. So, this is a, a little tiny room where uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, gave birth to King James VI of Scotland, who became James I of England in 1566. Now, in 1603, James VI <laughs> succeeded to the throne of um, uh, Ireland, England, and Ireland. Uh, then in 1604, a year later, he gave permission for a new translation of the Bible into English to be undertaken, and this was completed in 1611. Uh, and so that's basically what we have today. Now, interesting here, because people say, well, King James Bible, whatever, but he never wrote a word of it. Now, he did insist, for instance, like uh, baptisma, a vow of baptisma, for which we get baptism, or baptizo, the verb, but to baptize. We, he did insist that they be transliterated, not, uh, not um, uh, a, uh, translated. So he, he had it put baptism instead of immerse. Um, when William Carey, missionaries and others later on, they, they came to, uh, uh, to Burma and to India and places like that, they insisted on, uh, on putting in uh, the Baptist and putting in immerse. But the Bible societies would not support them financially, and so that caused a separation between the Bible societies and these people. But uh, so a little bit of history there. Uh, okay, so um, <clears throat> without getting too deep into this, let, let's move on if we can. Okay, this is um, Hampton Court Palace, where that conference. Who's been there? Oh, okay, great, fascinating place. About a thousand rooms. Can't see most of them. We don't know the actual room in which uh, this permission was given, but a, a group of, uh, uh, of reformers there or, or um, just um, people who were, uh, were resisting the excesses of the Anglican Church there, and Dr. John Reynolds led them and so on, so they're pu Puritans and so on. So they, they wanted a new translation. They had a lot of requests of King James, but the only one he granted really was the, the translation of a new Bible. Uh, and, uh, but he saw this as a political move, probably, uh, more than a theological necessity, but uh, you know, um, I think it's important. But he, he also um, uh, said that, uh, see, William Tyndale translated um, church, ecclesia in the Greek, he translated that congregational assembly, all right. And so, uh, the original word um, 
congregation is from which the Americans get the word Congress for their, their, their government and so on. So, uh, but, the, uh, but he said, um, uh, this is, uh, but this is not acceptable. He wanted the word church. Okay, from come from Kirk or whatever, or you know, Kirsch or whatever. So kind of, but so um, uh, from from Latin or whatever. But uh, certainly, um, uh, but nevertheless, you know, we understand if we if we read the Bible correctly in context, we understand what these things mean. Baptism can only be immersion. In fact, you are immersing and immersing. Actually, but it can only so if as long as we teach the correct way. But of course, if we keep people ignorant of that, or we try and um, confuse them, or whatever, then that uh, that becomes an issue, a problem. So you know, we uh, the original word means immersion there to, to dip or to to submerge or whatever. So if you if it's used when you're like dyeing a garment, so if you pushed a, a garment under the and to dye a garment there, you wouldn't have anything not submerged it would be completely submerged or when the <coughs> when the the tides come in and, and covered the reeds completely and that was that was baptized they, they were baptized so they always meant immersion uh dipping completely immersing so and so on <coughs> but uh, that was not acceptable to king james uh, so that's interesting so so we were left it with baptism but we know what it means there because the bible tells us there they went into the water and they come out of the water and so on we find this um in in, in acts 8 and things so okay we move on uh so translation timeline this is just a little bit uh, leading up to the 1611 then so um we have um uh in the reformation in 1517 luther's translation into german and the geneva bible and so on they were translated uh, from the original text Okay, so did a fairly credible job with these and so on. So, uh, you know, they, they were fairly accurate, all right. Uh, but, uh, but things moved on uh, after a while. But, so we have early partial translations, Bede and Alfred, etc. Uh, just parts of the Bible were, uh, in it, were, were translated into, um, uh, into English then, into Old English, even before Middle English it came in, so uh, let alone Modern English. So uh, then we got Wycliffe translation from the Latin there in the late 14th century. Printing press invented, fall of Constantinople, 1453. Interesting then, I've inserted there historically, you see the Spanish Armada in 1588. Now the Spanish Armada is just, I think this is relevant. The Spanish Armada was an attempt by the king in Spain uh, to invade Britain uh, with an army big enough to defeat Britain and impose Catholicism on our country. And the, the Catholic uh, monks on board ships even had their instruments of torture of the Inquisition and so on. And uh, well, providentially, our, our, our Francis Drake and others, they, they, they shot and they sunk a few of these ships, but mostly they were, God sent a storm, I believe, and it blew them up the English Channel and they, these, these, most of these ships never made it home. They crashed on the, 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 the uh, northern coast of Ireland and Scotland and so on. And uh, we visited some places where you can see where the, ships have crashed and so on so fascinating providential all about this time so 1588 you see and after that then it's only what uh, 12 15 years after that the king james comes on the throne and in 1604 uh, the um, hampton court Conf conference there in 1604 uh, where uh, a year after King James is on the throne, he gives permission for this Bible to be translated. So it took uh, seven years to 1611, but uh, we can talk about it if we're necessary. But, uh, but interestingly, in 1605, we have what? The gunpowder plot. <laughs> okay, so Guy Fawkes or Guido Fawkes and so on. So this was a Jesuit Catholic attempt to blow up the king, the House of Parliament. You see, but actual fact, it was betrayed by a Catholic who could not understand, could not accept the idea of regicide or king of king. So uh, interesting. Um, so, um, but this was providential, I believe, because obviously uh, if King James had been blown up then, uh, then uh, his successor, you know, may well have, well, would have brought Catholicism back to, uh, to, to England, of course, then the King James Bible would never have been completed. So historically, I believe there's providential uh, acts of God here and so on, so it's important. And then of course, then we've got the King James author in 1611. So I think it gives a bit of perspective on, on, on this, you know, historically here. I mean, if God has preserved his words, we'd expect to see some evidence of this providentially, historically, and so on. I mean, I think so we do see this here. 
And so it's important. So if we move on, <coughs> and um, so here we have the 1611, then we move on from there. Uh, and then so, okay, now William Tyndale we mentioned. So in 1534, uh, he rebuked a man by the name of George Joy, who without authorization published a corrected version of Tyndale's work omitting the word resurrection. A resurrection was changed to life after this life or very life, etc. Which, what does that mean? Uh, so was Tyndale justified in issuing rebuke? Absolutely. Just like this lady said, I'm not having that. You changed my score on the music and so on. So um, uh, he, uh, he complained to this George Joy about this. Well, that's not what I translated and so on. So, uh, so and now in Luke 4, 16 to 21 here, the Lord opened the scroll, and of course he had a scroll then of Isaiah, they didn't have um, chapters and verses in those days, they just had a whole scroll. And um, uh, in, uh, so he goes in the synagogue in Nazareth, and he turns to what we would know as chapter 61 of Isaiah, verses 1 and 2, and he read from and commented on it. Now we can we possibly conceive this was not preserved scripture. There were errors, omissions, changes, alterations, textual variants in the Hebrew text. For G would I hold, I would hold up this scroll and say, this is the word of God. Absolutely. This is the word of God. I mean, he says to Satan, you know, man uh, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word we saw that's been chopped out of Persians. By every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And so uh, here it is, Christ picked up there. So we can be confident that for, from 1400 BC, when Moses uh, wrote the first five books of the Bible, uh, right the way through uh, to when Christ came, 1400 or so years, nearly 1500 years, uh, we see that um, he was able to say, this is the word of God. So there's preservation of the Old Testament clearly there. We've got a chart line in a minute. So it's important to see that there. Uh, I, I do not believe he holds something up there. And um, Could you, if you held up the NIV today, or the New King James, it would show that, um, or you held up the uh, New American Standard Bible, or the, um, a new, uh, the English Standard Version, which kind of almost replaced that, and so on. Very Calvinist, by the way. Uh, and um, so if you hold those up, can you say, this is the Word of God? Um, I, I could say it contains the word of God but I believe we can hold up our King James Bible and say this is the word of God uh, and I think there's a big difference between the two there because we'll see what's been missing from these modern versions or changes as we go through further on, on the seminar today so if we move on here uh, again uh, we see here the Bible verses uh, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 17 account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation he was our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable, rest as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So Peter was saying, you know there's skullduggery going on with the word of God <laughs> at that time. You know at that time, this is the first century here. I mean, just only a few decades after Christ has, uh, has departed to heaven. And what do you find there? You find everybody's trying to corrupt the word of God. Astonishing. So we move on. Uh, and then we find 2 Thessalonians 2. Paul says, to the Be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letters from us as the day of Christ is at hand. Uh, so um, uh, again... Uh, both Paul and Peter knew the word of God indeed the very words of God were under attack in their day and make no mistake about it God's word has been under attack from the beginning yea hath God said Genesis 3 1 uh, so there's a lot more we could say about that so then he says Paul to Corinthians we're not as many many there that corrupt the word of God but as of sincerity but as of but as of sincerity but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So many are corrupting the word even in that day. Now the most, the biggest corruptions pretty to, to the word of God came, the original text came in the first two or three hundred years. Uh, the biggest corruptions really. And, um, but um, we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. But there, those were later ones. But that, that was really the main time when it was under attack here. Now, so we just got these other verses here. I fear less on him is a serpent beguiled Eve, and so on through the Saturday. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplest. It's in Christ, and so on. And then it talks about the great dragon that's in Revelation. There was cast into the 
the old servant called the devil and was cast, uh, who deceives the whole world, cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So what is this deception uh, there? Uh, certainly ecumenism, uh, that is the deception. Obviously, the, the messing with the text here, that's deception. They're really, I mean, uh, obviously, um, particular areas of attack are on the Bible and the person and work and nature of Jesus Christ. These are the really areas they go off. There are some other areas, but these are really some areas that they really do attack primarily there. So what we're going to see is most of these things are affecting uh, what we look at today. So if we move on here. Uh, this was in the Philippines, when we were in the Philippines in 2016, uh, there. This is outside a Roman Catholic church in the Philippines, and they got the Ten Commandments. Now, if you read a Roman Catholic translation, they have the Ten Commandments there, but you read their catechisms, it's a lot different. Okay, so I've pointed out here, if you're, so what is the, without looking at the screen, if anybody can, uh, what's the first three commandments? I shall have no other God before me. Right, the second one is no graven image. Okay, where is that on there? It's missing. How do they get Ten Commandments? They divide the tenth one into two. This is outside of Rome, like today, it's there today in Philippines, there in English on the wall of a Catholic church. Uh, Deuteronomy 4 2 says, Thou shalt not diminish, add the word or, or diminish anything from it, and so on. Astonishing things. I mean, that is barefaced, because you can go down the road from there and you see the Queen of Heaven school and so on. Of course, if you look at Jeremiah 7 and Jeremiah 44, I mean, Queen of Heaven, that's talking about yeah, the virgin and, uh, and the child there, which comes uh, uh, from Babylon, Tamaz and Semiraz, the son and so on. So this incredible, and it becomes Osiris and Isis and Egypt and everything, but the bait idea, and then you had the Madonna and child with the cat, with the, so this is all, uh, it's all developed, so this, you see this incredible how these things happen, and so people are so deceived by all this, so just again, you can see another, I, unfortunately, it was a big van park right there, so I couldn't get a full-on uh, picture, uh, but, um, you know, there it is, uh, missing completely there, the second commandment there, well, of course, Catholics, if you go there and we, all, we, go, we go down the, another part of the town there and then the, uh, there's women walking on their knees up to the altar and so on. People queuing up in 90 degrees heat to just go and touch these 14 foot high image of El Nino and so on that was given by a, a Spanish conquistador or whatever and um, uh, they're just going up to kind of kiss it and touch it and whatever and weeping at it and that's incredible. Um, so they don't want to talk about images and, and worshipping images and things so on. So, so you see there's a vested interest whenever Catholics involved or Anglo-Catholics or whatever, uh, pseudo-Catholics, then you, there's a vested interest there in removing that, and of course with all their worship of Mary and everything else like this and so on. So interesting. All right, so all of these things are relevant to what's affecting the, the translations today. Now, a point to consider then when evaluating Bible translation. No sooner did the incarnate word ascend into heaven and the written word was assorted by our enemy Satan using every means, devious, devious means in disposal, method of disposal, pardon me. He has been ably assisted by those who unwittingly or wittingly do his bidding. Dean John W. Bergen, 1881, he rendered about that. He, he, uh, when the new, we'll talk about it later on, but when the new uh, English versions were, were started to be translated there in 1881, we'll talk about it later on. There, he reacted against this, and so he, re he wrote a co book called The Revision Revised, uh, and uh, that's interesting. Now, Dr. D. A. Wait, uh, we can, do he has a Bible for today. He's, he's died now, but but um, uh, I met him in London once. But I kind of, um, but anyway, he's written a lot of material on this, and um, interesting, because he was a Greek professor at a Bible seminary. And he had, to get a, um, a degree, you had to have 120 credit hours. He had that alone on languages, <laughs> plus everything else. <laughs> and uh, so he was very, very quality. He was a Greek scholar, Hebrew scholar. A lady came up to him one day, one of his students, said, Dr. Waite, do you know there's a book in our college library that says there's a different text to what we're using? He said, there is. And it was this revision revised by Dean John Bergen, who was Dean of Chichester in, 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 back in the 1800s. 
So, <clears throat> interesting enough, he went down, he checked it out, and he found out that for most of history, we've been using the Textus Receptus, which is behind the King James Bible. He was using the modern Greek text, and he didn't even know the existence of the old text, and he was a professor. That's astonishing. You see, this goes to show how sincere men See, now he uh, passionately supports the King James and, and the text behind it now and so on, but it just goes to show how sincere people, you know, let alone insincere people, uh, can, you know, really put across wrong information and so on. So I think it's important that we, we recognise these things because, you know, so much uh, confusion out there and, and people use academic nonsense there with their arguments and so on, intellectualism and so on, try and bamboozle people and, uh, and just sort of hold people down, well, suppress the truth, as it puts in Romans 1, <laughs> kind of thing, hold down the truth. So that's important there. So we carry on here. Uh, again, he says, look, Bergen says this, that which distinguishes sacred science from every other science which can be named is that is divine. It has to do with a book which is inspired, that is, whose true author is God. It's unique there. You know, I can read this Bible and I can get a bad conscience, I can be convicted, I can be motivated, I can be stirred up there, rebuked or whatever. Uh, it really just impacts my soul. I pick up any other book, and it doesn't do that. I get emotional, sentimental, but not like I get with the Bible. There's a, there's a conviction there. Uh, and, and that's different. And so, you know, thank the Lord for that. Even as an unbeliever, you know, I, I just somehow knew that the King James Bible there was the Bible, not this New English Bible. I mean, I, how you explain that, I don't know, but, I, but, but I, it's in my testimony. Okay, now, <clears throat> move on. <clears throat> he also said that it's impossible that all this can be too clearly apprehended. In fact, until those who make the words of the New Testament their study are convinced they move in a region like no other, where unique phenomena await them at every step. Where se this is when he wrote, 1750 years ago, depraving causes unknown in every other department of learning were actively at work. Progress cannot really be made in the present discussion. And uh, that is absolutely it, until those are convinced and convicted. And that's why we do these seminars there, because we want people to be convinced and convicted here, because the pressure will be on Skelmersdale Baptist Church, West Bands Up Baptist Church, our church and area. The pressure will be on to move. People will come in there, they'll say, nice, sweet, godly people, friendly, and so on, and they'll say a lot of good biblical things, and so on. They'll be very eloquent speakers there, and they've been all the modern training and whatever there, and, and um, they've got all the qualifications, quote unquote, and, and whatever, you know. And, um, <clears throat> and so, oh, yeah, well, no, we'll, you know, we'll have him. See, what happens when I die or when I can't carry on? I'll be 75 in July. And what happens when I can't carry on? You know, our church, I tell our church, I pray you'll continue to stand. Continue to stand. Do not move. No matter how much pressure, intellectual pressure, peer pressure, uh, social pressure, cultural pressure, there, woke pressure, <laughs> no matter how much pressure you get there, uh, how much academic nonsense you get in there, do not budge. Stand on the word of God and God will bless you there. You may have to pay a price for it, but great will be your reward in heaven. You know, and... and uh, that's why we, 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 we preach these, uh, teach these sessions here because it's so important there. You know, you're just as important to us as our own church in Basingstoke, believe me. You know, we love you all and, and uh, we pray for you all and, uh, and uh, it's Preston, isn't it? You know, so we, pray, you know, so we, we, we pray about this. You know, it's important that we, you see, because we, we can't, be, but we pray for you. You're going to stand on the word of God there. It's important there, see. And so um, don't let anybody come in there you know, and, and um, have any other ideas than what we put forward today on, from, the, from the Bible here, on, on the Word of God there, because that's the beginning of the end for our church. Uh, absolutely there. So two things that are going to ruin a church, really, when you move. One is the Bible issue, the second is music. When you go down on these things, that's it, you've had it. Uh, and uh, so we see it every time. I mean, I've seen it many, many years now. <laughs> and we've seen so many churches there. And you've heard, you love the people. And they preach well and so on, and bit by bit by bit, you know. And then if the pastor goes, somebody new comes in. Oh, that's it. <laughs> you know, so be careful. Okay, carry on here. Okay, 
Point to consider when evaluating Bible training. If something is simpler but wrong, it's no good. Well, we saw already that these modern versions aren't simpler. We'll give some more examples in a minute. But um, those who adhere to the authorised version have not moved and therefore cannot be accused of causing division. We know uh, dear friends, missionaries, who 30 years ago or 40 years ago were supported by churches that uh, they took the stand they did on the King James and whatever, at least they su support on that basis. Uh, and um, I've actually done seminars in places there. And after the seminars there, uh, there then um, <clears throat> Jack Mormon and I did a seminar in one place. And after that seminar in Ireland, uh, there, uh, the home church uh, removed their support from the missionary because they'd moved away. They'd moved away from the King James to modern versions. Their missionary hadn't moved. They supported him faithfully. They were so happy to send him out originally. But now, you see, they've moved away. And so I'm trying to make this practical as well. You know, and give some personal illustrations here. So it's important here. So, you know, I, I think that's terrible. You know, but God will take care. You know, God will take care of these people. But um, you see, uh, uh, that's reprehensible. It really is. Uh, and so we we see this um, uh, this problem today. So I can speak from experience here. You know, really. So I, I actually wrote to the people involved, the pastor involved, and I said, look, you know. Uh, we're over here, we're struggling to get churches started. You've got a missionary here that's already started a church, got a national pastor starting another one. I said, thank you very much. I said, that's all we need. You know, we don't need your help here to try and make things, you know. We've got enough problems out without, um, uh, without you cutting off all these missionaries and things like that are doing a great job. So anyway, but so <clears throat> uh, devotees of new versions complain when we defend the authorised version but they advocate informed choices for their readers. Uh, if you want to get people upset then, you talk about the King James Bible. You can talk about the other Bibles and so on, and uh, then praise them up, whatever. Uh, yeah, oh, that's great, and so on. But as soon as you get onto the King James, it's the only one. Uh, in fact, somebody said once, actually, uh, they said they went into uh, <coughs> uh, Catholic Truth Society bookshop. That's a contradiction of terms. But um, <laughs> they went to a Catholic Truth Society bookshop and the only version of the Bible they couldn't find is the King James. They could find all the other modern versions and so on. So that speaks volumes. <laughs> that speaks volumes. So um, interesting. All right, so the authorized version uses the formal equivalence method of translation, but the new versions, either in the text or in the footnotes, or both use the dynamic equivalence method. So two methods, formal, dynamic, really. Uh, in every, even in the, new King, in the King James, there has to be slightly, there's some dynamic, you know, just putting it into... Uh, uh, to, to the modern culture there. I mean, for instance, italicised words there, not in the original, but they have to be supplied, really. Um, I did a seminar in um, <clears throat> um, Northern Ireland, Belfast area, and somebody asked me afterwards, uh, no, it's not with Belfast, it's another town, but anyway, but um, somebody asked me afterwards about a translation there, I think it was in uh, Titus there, it says, a lover of good men. He said, well, men is italicised. I said, yeah, but good is a masculine adjective. So it it's, it's, <laughs> implies uh, men. It's a masculine adjective. And, and one has to be careful. Somebody else in America, when I did a, a, a preaching over there, they talked to me about something or other, why it uses a feminine so here. I said, because it's a feminine noun, the original. Uh, and one has to be careful uh, because people come up with these arguments. And, and if people don't understand this or don't know this, uh, then they're influenced by it and so on. So uh, immediately they've got a question mark on the Bible. Uh, and we've got to be careful with this. We're treading in holy ground here. Uh, and we've got to be careful with this. So we move on here. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll be quick. So translation commits a modern version are ecumenical in nature and therefore have to satisfy a wide spectrum of theological beliefs. And, and that's just a, the fact of it. Matter. They would not get the finances. They didn't. All right. And so, by the way, uh, money comes at this a lot. Uh, when the, the latest version now is the English Standard Version, which is being promoted there, and then the New American Standard was before that, and then, of course, the NIV, uh, and uh, that's very common in Britain, uh, and all sorts of problems. But, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, the sales drop off, and they get a new version. And everybody goes out and buys that, and all oh, these scholars say all these wonderful things about that. And there's over 200 English versions that have come out the last 150 years. It's unbelievable. What are we, 200 versions? I mean, uh, it's incredible, really. Uh, it's just, just something else. But um, uh, okay, so uh, there are many undesirable results, and we're going to show this that from the proliferation of modern versions. Decline in memorization, really. 
I always remember Jack Mormon, he said he used to memorize scripture and he, he memorized the King James and so on. But then he, he looked at the New American Standard Bible, he tried to memorize that and he got a headache. Um, because <laughs> he said that, uh, <clears throat> uh, you see, his point is, and it's a valid point, uh, the New Testament Greek text is shorter, but the English words of the modern Bible are longer. Uh, this is fascinating. Um, to get a copyright, by the way, the King James is not copyright. It's a, the people say it's copyright. It wasn't. It was a, it was a royal commission there, really, uh, and um, uh, the royal, uh, the royal patent there in England only. So when that was printed originally there, uh, Scotland and Ireland, Scotland and England, for instance, didn't come politically united in parliaments until 1707, whereas they became uh, monarch, uh, you know, the monarch related with the king back in 1603. Uh, so. But you could, uh, 1611, that you could get a, a version in Scotland, you see, uh, that, that could be pr printed, uh, you could get a copy, but not in England, because it's only the Oxford and Cambridge universities were given permission in England to translate the Bible, uh, to, to print the Bibles, by the way. By the way, there's four differences between the Oxford and the Cambridge editions. So the Cambridge is correct, but there's, there's hardly anything at all, but we'll talk about that another time. Uh, but um, so... Undermining confidence in God's word, a climate of change, in other words, more change easier there. So um, when they come in with a, a massive change, people say, oh, I'm not accepting that. So they change it incrementally, bit by bit by bit by bit by bit. It's very subtle, we're going insid insidious, very subtle and so on. So, uh, and then uh, doctrinal compromise and declining morality. So let's look at some examples of these, if we can. Uh, the example of how climate of change operates there. So 1 Timothy 3.16 is one of the key verses there. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, received unto glory. And at UNSB uh, here, he revealed in the flesh, not God. NIV, he appeared in the binny, not God. Um, and uh, ESV, the latest one, he, with a one stuck in there, that's helpful, isn't it? Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, was manifest in the flesh. In a footnote and there, he, um, he appeared in a body, uh, t uh, today's New English version, uh, New, New, yeah, New International Version, pardon me. So, so you get footnotes there, footnotes, some later manuscripts read God. In fact, actually, the vast majority of manuscripts read God. Uh, so that's a lie in itself. Uh, footnote, Greek, who, some manuscripts, so on. Get to, the, to today's New, New International Version, no footnote even. So people say, well, there isn't the footnotes there. That is so unhelpful. And by the way, every reference Bible, whether it's Schofield or anything else, and you can find a lot of good things in there, where Schofield was a gap theory guy and so on, so I've got some other issues, problems, but, uh, you know, I don't believe in the gap theory. But, but you know, I mean, a the I mean, on prophecy and so on, a lot of it we agree with and so on, but, but you know, the footnotes are not inspired. It's only the text that's inspired. <laughs> And that's the key thing that we've got to be. So uh, these can be helpful there, but also for a vast majority of people, they can be very unhelpful and deadly, downright dangerous if, if, in, in many cases there because, you know, people just get to think, well, that's, you know, that's as authoritative as the text. Uh, and if you start to think that way, you're, you're, you're walking on thin ice. You know, walking on eggshells there because I think so. Okay, so as an example of our claim that change operates, well, then you see, gradually they remove things. <clears throat> Some of undermining confidence in the Word of God. Now, this is the new King James we're looking at here. <clears throat> All right, so words of a tailbearer as wounds, they go down to the innermost parts of the belly, become the words of a tailbearer are like tasty trifles. <laughs> what in the world is that all about? <laughs> I mean, it could have been written by Hans Christian Andersen. I mean, it just, <laughs> I mean, really, <laughs> Aesop's fables. Uh, I, I mean, it's incredible. Then we move on. Proverbs 19:18. Chasten thy son while there is yet hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. It becomes chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. Let that sink in. 
Don't spare because do not set your heart on his destruction. That's completely the opposite. And plus the fact it's not what it's saying there. I mean, this, this is a theological interpretation. It is not a translation. Uh, you see, this is the problem. So we move on. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Acts 2.30, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn by an oath, with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. You see, Christ became, in the NIV, one of his descendants to sit on the throne. Well, that's true. Um, <clears throat> that is true. Uh, but um, <clears throat> there's a lot of difference. Who, who is that? Anybody could claim to be that. Mohammed? Is that Mohammed? You know, is that uh, Guru Nanak who started the, uh, the, the Sikhs or whatever there? Or, you know, Vishnu? Or sort of, um, you know, who, who is it? Yeah, Zoroastria? Uh, Zoroastria, rather. But uh, so we don't know. Anyway, so. Uh, but it says, and then the New American Standard Bible says, and one of his descendants upon his throne. That, uh, so, again, uh, it's not defining who is this. It's talking about the Christ, the, the, the Messiah, the Siak in the Old Testament, the, the, the Christ and so on, and Christos in the New Testament. So, but um, interesting. So, uh, example of doctrinal compromise again, by keep on my body, bring subjection, as by any means when I preach that I myself should be a castaway. This is very, very important. He says, no, I beat my body. We don't beat our bodies. That's what the Catholics do. They're, that's what the ascetics do. Maybe the Eastern Orthodox, whatever there. And uh, silent starlights sat on the top of a 30-foot pole with a platform for 30 years or something or other. And then uh, he just had people love, love them up food and so on. They come and shit. And he sat on the top of a platform for 30 years and so on. And uh, somehow became more holy. And everybody's uh, going after him. I mean... Uh, and oh, it's incredible, really. But beat my body there. We know um, there's an interesting book called uh, Pilgrimage from Rome by Bartholomew Brewer. Anybody have come across that? Okay, yeah. Fascinating. He was a discalced, uh, barefoot Carmelite monk. A and uh, they also calced Carmelite monks, you know, uh, disc one, one for his shoes, the others didn't. All at odds between themselves. Uh, and then, um, but he, he said he had to get permission to wear this sort of stuff around his legs or his body, wherever they got bits of glass and metal or whatever, you know, and they, they, they really caused a lot of pain and discomfort. You get permission from the abbot to wear some of these things or whatever, and, uh, and uh, somehow or other, that's going to make you more holy and it's going to make you uh, have a less temptation with the flesh and so on. But the flesh, you know, comes from uh, Adamic nature there. And we'll, I'll have a problem with it as long as I'm here on this earth before I get the glory. And so are you. And if we live to be 100 there, I'd have just as big a problem. There's now just a bigger problem at 74 uh, than I had at 24 or 20, when I, 26 when I got saved. Just as big a problem, you know, with that flesh there and so on. So we've got to be careful with that. But, but then I, uh, New American stand, I buffet my body and so on. No, we don't do that at all. Yeah, you know, uh, see, that's... Um, this is this dynamic equivalence business, but it's not, it's not scripture. Can we move on there? Uh, Galatians 5.12, I would even, I would even, they cut off, which trouble you. To cut off means to get them out of your side, whatever there and so on, becomes, see, cutting off them, that's something you do to somebody else uh, there, becomes in the NIV, as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. That is pathetic really um so that's interesting so you've gone from cut off something you do to something they do to themselves you see that uh there so uh so it's a passive thing idea in the first idea that they, that somebody else cuts them off um whereas opposed here you mutilate yourself you get the idea there uh, so again, the New American Standard there, mutilate themselves. English Standard, emasculate themselves. New King James, even cut themselves off or mutilate themselves, footnote. That is not what it's saying. It's not what it's saying. You see, you go back and you look at the Bible there in the Old Testament, and if someone does this, they'll be cut off from the congregation. They don't cut themselves to bits, they've cut off by the congregation. 
You see, so one is passive, one's active. See a completely different emphasis here. So we move on here. This is incredibly important. So, um, <clears throat> the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, Go unto thy sea, will I give this land, Genesis 12:7, uh, to one of your descendants I will give this land. Now that's interesting. So you notice there, descendants is plural. Seed is singular. Yep. You notice that there? So note the change from seed singular to descendants plural. Uh, and, but compare the Bible interpretation, this verse in Galatians 3:16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises that he saith, not to seeds as of many, but as one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the Bible tells us, it's talking about one seed, one person, Christ, and his descendants, plural. That is theological heresy. You see this, see this here? I mean, it's, it's horrendous. And people aren't told these things these days. And they, Who would pick this up normally? Be honest about it. Now, who reads the whole Bible through regularly enough to know all these verses? And not, if you were heard a preacher preach these things and so on, listen, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. You know every verse of the Bible, and somebody preach something, and uh, I might, I, I'd, I'd get a few alarm bells ringing here, and I'd get quite a few alarm bells ringing. But, but, you know, I wouldn't know every verse and so on. They could say something, now I could easily miss it, and so on, and and um, it, it just becomes just sort of, well, that's it. People just get there. Uh, get used to this and so on and it becomes a thing really and then because then they start to then do to to preach on those things and on the theological uh, error that they've already put into the Bible and they'll preach on that and so on and so this is how it goes so <clears throat> uh, it's incredible so we move on again so again uh, 1 Peter 1 18 uh, received by tradition from your fathers and it says received a few from the futile way of life well, there's a little difference there. Empty way of life there and so on and, uh, in IV. Uh, and uh, on, on, no, on every other occasion when the same Greek, Greek, word, Greek word is used, the New Testament, with the exception of the NIV in, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, where it's teaching, the New Omega and the NIV have tradition. So the only place they've taken tradition now is that one verse. Uh, it, it, you see, these are subtle things, uh, and they uh, uh, they do affect the, the way that you you um, uh, that you look at the Bible, really. So we move on, and uh, so example doctrine. Okay, it talks to woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and so on. And it says complete verse missing from the NIV, uh, but the, Ameri the New American Standard retains that verse. And you're going to find this as we go on, that the NIV and the New American Standard and so on, and they, they chop and change. One leaves this in, the other one doesn't, and so on, and uh, unbelievable. Uh, so we'll talk more about that later on in this afternoon session, uh, if, if you're still here. <laughs> so uh, we're nearly 12 o'clock, nearly time for a break. Carry on here. Uh, so, um, all right. So the angel came to her and said, Blessed art thou among women. You see, uh, well, the blessed art thou among women is, is, um, uh, is missing from the New American Standard Bible with a footnote. Later manuscripts add, you are blessed among women. Now, so what they're saying is basically our King James has added, because we use that so-called text that they say has been added. So they're saying that we've added to the word of God here. Uh, no, we haven't. Um, and it's only a ha we're going to talk about the Greek manuscripts afterwards, but it's only a handful of Greek manuscripts that actually do these things. There's a lot of material here. We won't get it all through today, I don't think. But So anyway, uh, other examples here. He should appear to your joy here in, in Isaiah 66, 5. Uh, it says that we, may see, that, that we may see your joy. Not he should appear to your joy. This is the, in this is the incoming of Christ. It's missing. It's missing. Incredible. I mean, it's not just us being a little bit dogmatic and, you know, and stubborn and whatever. Or, you know, you know, you're just being judgmental. Um, I get this all the time. Do you? you get this all the time? I get it all the time there. and It's incredible, really. Well, uh, no, it's not. It is vitally important, the word of God there. Holy ground. It's important. We, we should. Incredible. So the, the New King James follows the modern versions there, by the way, again. So examples are there, again, uh, King James there. 
It, this is absolutely crucial. Look at this. Um, Verily took on him the nature of angels. This is Christ. But, but he, he, he took not on him the nature of angels, but took on him that seed of Abraham becomes, in the New King James Bible, and it follows the NOV, the American Standard, the English Standard Version, becomes, for indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he gives aid to the seed of Abraham. What does that mean? How did he help us out a bit? How did he help us out a bit here? Anybody, anybody enlighten me on this? <laughs> I mean, this is the incarnation. This is the virgin birth. This is unbelievable. And self, the second thing, uh, he, somebody's working through him. He's the, the indirect, uh, if you like. That he's a direct there in the Bible there, but he's made indirect in the modern Bibles. You see that? Uh, so again, this is very, very important uh, point here. So uh, we need to be, uh, be mindful of that there. Um, the Jehovah's Witness, of course, in Colossians 1, uh, it says all things were made by him. Of course, they put in brackets all other things were made by him. Uh, so they've added that in in brackets there because they do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. So he was a, a sucker secondary God and so on. So God used him. You know, that's on the pattern of what we call Gnosticism. We can't get in that today, but uh, we just we need to, to get onto that another time. But uh, if we... Um, ah. Fantastic. We're, we're good. David, okay. David, you mentioned that there were some verses you used in the first session about the body being evil, about vomiting your body. Those are also Gnostic positions. Yes, absolutely. The, they taught that the body is evil. Yes, yes, indeed. Is Flesh is evil in Gnosticism there. It's just the spirit that, that's important there. So um, when um, Colossians 2 9. See, the book of Colossians and 1 John that were written to combat what we call Gnosticism. And um, Gnosticism it undermines most of modern theology. And so uh, Gnosticism says, well, flesh is evil. Uh, so therefore, um, body. Jesus Christ, body. the body is evil, the flesh, that's right. But it's the spirit that counts and so on. So that's the thing. So, so the flesh is evil. So... They don't like the idea of the incarnation, you see, Christ coming in the flesh. See, this is so important. So, um, well, God, uh, God, the original God from their conception of God, could not have uh, created um, the flesh itself or the, or the body itself because the body is evil. So they have uh, these, uh, what they call demiurges, that were, um, so these were created beings by God. And in turn, because Christ was a created being, you know, see, by, by God, and so in turn, they created, you know, he created um, uh, the, the flesh, the, the bodies, you see, so that disconnects the, the, the ultimate God from being responsible for creating something evil, which is the body, because the, the, the body is not evil, but, but you see, this is the, uh, the whole concept there. So, uh, it, uh, Colossians 2, it says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and, and so the, the word fullness there is pleroma, uh, which means entire, complete. And so um, uh, that's important there because it says there that, um, <clears throat> uh, that you see in Christ dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead. So there, he, he couldn't be anything less than God. You see, that's important. Then the next verse says, and ye are complete in him, through whom is all. So it goes on there, you're complete in him. And so you don't need to know anything else apart from the word of God, you see, in Christ. So that's the point. So the, the Gnostics said, well, you've got to have this secret or esoteric knowledge. And you've got to add that to, uh, you see, this is the whole point there. And this is what's behind a lot of the modern theology there. And for instance, Catholicism and others, they studied Plato, Aristotle, these Greek philosophers, these pagan, uh, but they were pantheists and they believed in God is everything and everything is God and so on. So, you know, you've got to bear that in mind when you think of all oh, this is behind this modern movement to turn away uh, people from the truth. And, and so it's important, really. So, yeah, that's a good point to raise. Thank you. So that's good. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So Romans 1, see, of Christ is missing there and uh, Hebrews 1, 3, our and by himself missing uh, and uh, 
1 Peter 4 1, for us is missing. Christ died for us. Uh, just so, but Christ, you know, so for us is missing. That's important. You see, so 1 Corinthians 5 7, for us is missing. You know, uh, so um, he is our pastor, which is sacrificed for us. Uh, but for us is missing. So he's just sacrificed. Well, for what? For whom? You see, so there's the terrible, important detraction or diminution of the word of God here. This is important there. So if we move on here, um, <clears throat> Revelation 13, 8. This is fascinating here. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, this is talking about the tribulation time to come, the seven-year tribulation time to come, uh, and the time of Jacob's trouble, called, uh, Jeremiah 30, chapter 30, time of great Jacob's trouble. Now, it says, oh, but the, the uh, NASB and the e ESB, uh, you see, have this. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was, who was had slain. So they've turned the whole sentence around here. And so it's not Christ that was slain before the foundation of the world. It was the elect that were in the book of life before the foundation of the world. This is a Calvinistic interpretation. This is incredibly important here. So this is, um, you see, this is, this is really very, very sinister. Now, if they believe Calvinism is okay, but don't mess with the word of God to try and, you know, and you see, because they've taken away a doctrine of Christ here to do that. And that's incredibly important. So we see this is a, is a real issue today that are behind, uh, you know, these issues. There's a lot of theological prejudice and, and presupposition behind uh, some of these, many of these changes there and this whole movement to change and so on. So you'll find that, uh, particularly people of Calvinist persuasion are really keen on the New American Standard Bible and then they've also moved on to the English Standard Version and they will claim it's the most accurate on the translation of the Greek verbs and the Greek nouns and so on. Uh, but actual fact, you know, there are many, many problems with, uh, uh, with these versions here. So, so the ESV is the latest darling of the Calvinists and so on. So um, anyway, so we move on. Uh, and... <clears throat> God clearly states he'll preserve his word. So Psalm 12, 6 and 7, uh, the words of the pure, the pure words, the silver trying to furnace and so on. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. There's a big debate on that verse there. We can talk about that, uh, that in a minute. But um, Isaiah 48, the grass with the flower fed, but the word of a God shall stand forever. Uh, not part of the word, but all of the word. <laughs> And uh, so on. And so Matthew 5.18, of course, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass for the law until it all be fulfilled. So um, uh, Christ didn't reckon anything was missing, and, and then neither was it in the Old Testament. So on. And then 1 Peter 1.25, the word of the Lord enjoy forever. This is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So uh, clearly it endures forever. We're getting now uh, all kinds of statements about people. Well, the Bible is so old. We spoke to one lady a couple of days ago and gave her a tract and so on shop. And she said, well, oh, I don't believe the Bible is so old. And um, yeah, other things she said, well, we kind of explained to her. But we invited her to come to church. She said she'll come. So I do pray she'll come. Uh, but um, uh, interesting, this is a young lady. We're praying that the younger people today are going to realize the bankruptcy of the generations that have just come by and, and, and really that they'll say, hang on a minute, this, we're, this isn't working, you know, and uh, there's got to be something more here. And let's pray that folks will start, get to, uh, to, start to thinking about things. We're told not to think now. You see, we're, we're full of amusement. To, to amuse is to think, to amuse is not to think. And so kind of, <laughs> we sort of, the, the Satan doesn't want us to think. He just wants you to just go up there. The Catholics will just turn up every week and so on. And somebody uh, we, we witnessed to and worked with and a friend, neighbor, and, and uh, was Catholic. And we talked about it. And, and then uh, she went, when spoke to the priest and she mentioned about the Baptist. She said, oh, they're one book people. And that's it. She walked away and so oh, that's, that's answered the question. <laughs> now we have to think about well, why are they one book people? <laughs> you know, so incredible. Anyway, so here we move on. Um, and um, so Psalm 12, 6 and 7, compared in the different versions. 
here. So in our version, we have, uh, thou shalt keep them, the words of the Lord, thou shalt keep them, or thou shalt preserve them forever. Uh, okay, in the New American Standard, NIV, and the English Standard Version, they change this. Uh, so, for instance, NASB says, the Lord's the pure words, thou, O Lord, wilt keep them, uh, thou wilt keep him from this generation forever. So who's him there? Well, if you go back to verse 5 in, John, in uh, Psalm 12, it talks about the poor and needy. So they, they go back there and they say, well, it's talking about the poor and needy, not about the words in verse 6. Now, there's a technical reason that they say that, uh, but that can be refuted, you see, and, uh, but we'll talk about it in a minute. So the NIV said, uh, the words of the Lord are flawless. They said, oh, Lord, you will keep us safe, not them, us and protect us from such people forever. And so again with the uh, English Standard Version, thou shalt guard us from this generation. So um, are we poor and needy? Uh, well, I don't think we're too poor materially, but I think we're, we're very rich spiritually, aren't we? But uh, kind of, but I don't think we're poor and needy, like uh, we're not in abject poverty, are we? <laughs> Anybody in abject poverty here? Uh, I'm not sure what this means, but uh, so, um, uh, yeah, it, it's so irrelevant, but also it's so heretical there. So it's the words that are preserved, not the poor and needy. Uh, and this is important here. So move on. Now, the problem, so-called in brackets, with Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Uh, to what are these words, thou shalt keep them, referring the words of God in verse 6, or the poor and needy in verse 5? Well, there's two rules of Hebrew grammar that they like to talk to. There's the proximity rule, uh, that the pronoun, us, them, or whatever they, uh, uh, is traced to the closest noun. Okay, so... Um, You've got words, you've got poor and needy, whatever. Uh, so um, uh, you've got, but the closest, the closest noun is words. Okay. Uh, but then the second rule is the word accepted gender discordance. So a masculine pronoun can refer to a feminine, that this is masculine, feminine, neuter in the different, we've only got masculine and feminine in English, so in other languages are gender neuter as well. Uh, particularly Greek and so on and uh, but anyway so uh, they say uh, there that uh, that because uh, there is a certain gender there it says thou shalt keep them you've got to look for the same gender as an antecedent there in the noun so they go back to chapter 5 or verse 5 rather to the poor and needy and they say the words in verse 6 or word you see uh, is a different gender and therefore it couldn't be talking about them but there's a problem there because the Bible uses these different changes around these different things in other areas there. Like Psalm 119 says, Thy testimony, which is feminine plural, have I taken as heritage forever, for they, masculine plural, are rejoicing of my heart. Now the closest matching antecedent to plural noun is wicked in verse 110. But that would be ridiculous because the wicked couldn't be the joy and rejoicing of your heart. Uh, so you see, uh, so... There are theological choices that God made, uh, and God makes the language, not us. And that's important. We, we understand that. And, um, you know, so we must take, when we deal with the Bible, we've got to take the language of the Bible as God has really put it in there and use it the same way as he uses it and not the way that modern scholars would like to constrict it. Uh, if I, so, so this is technical as we're going to get kind of just, uh, so um, you yeah, know it's um, uh, it's rather sneaky they, they use these things it sounds very convincing but it's not correct because there's, there's there is uh, discrepancies in, in the genders in the, in the original text for a reason there God does things for a reason so okay so um, Bible verses we've looked at some of these uh, teaching the preservation of scripture uh, being born again, not a corruptible, but an incorruptible, while the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. If I took a seed and I cut it in half, would it grow? I don't think so. I never tried it. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> so, um, but if you see, if you take away a bit from that seed there, uh, then it's not going to work, is it? So, um, 
You see, that, that's the thing. So the Bible's a, the, the seed there. You can't, you can't corrupt it there and, and get a spiritual fruit. You can't do that. So that's important. So um, <clears throat> Psalm 105, verse 8, they remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. That has uh, ramifications for the text issue, but also uh, from a prophetic standpoint. Uh, is wrong with the thought process in these modern Bibles. You know, so it's important that we, we recognize these, these issues here. So move on. Uh, so modern Bibles question the scientific and numerical references in the King James Bible and its underlying text of Masoretic Hebrew and the text of receptors. Consider this then. This is Dr. Chester Coolis. Now, Chester Coolis has written a fantastic, well, two fantastic books. One's called Those So-Called Errors and so on. Another one's called One Tittle. And they're talking about this morning preserving the jots and the tittles and everything in the Old Testament and the veil points. And he's written a world-class book on this and so on. So this is, uh, this is uh, terrific and so on. So these two books I have, uh, they're, not, they're not available. I don't think they're available on Amazon, but you could check it out. Uh, but Chester, Dr. Chester Coolis, uh, and uh, sometimes it's C-H-E-T, Chet, they've got sort of, well, but Chester, anyway, Coolis is um, K-U-L-U-S. So uh, these books are really incredibly uh, valuable. Very, very uh, uh, academic guy, but a spiritual guy, and, and uh, really it's, it's good. So, um, uh, yeah, so, but this is it. So people say, well, you know, the Bible's not accurate here, it's not accurate there. It, it doesn't really matter because it's the spiritual nature of the material that's important. No, I don't believe that. I do not believe we've got scientific books today that correct the Bible. I don't believe that. I'll stake my life on that, really. And then I don't want to get into geocentricity today, but <laughs> I passionately believe in this. I'd stake my life on it. I would, literally. Uh, so, Brother John. I've seen this in the church, but there be, and I witnessed, uh, I can't give his testimony, but a prominent uh, scientist. And he says he, he came, he went to university to prove that God didn't exist. He said, the more I studied it, the more I realized he did. Yeah, absolutely. You get books like Frank Morrison, Who Moved the Stone, for instance. Um, ben Hur is another one there. Uh, where so Dr. General Lou Wallace and started out with um, his friend uh, there to try and disprove the Bible. He's Ingersoll. But uh, he, he ended up writing Ben Hur. You know, it may not be the most spiritual, but he, you know, but he, he believed in, in, in the Messiah, and, and of course, uh, but his Ingersoll never did. But they both started out with it, and so Frank Morrison started out the same idea, and others have done the same thing, and so they they're trying to um, uh, trying to disprove the Bible, and the more they look at the evidence, the more it's convicts them the other way. So thank the Lord for that. Uh, so amen. So good. Well, we um, <clears throat> timeline illustrating the preservation of Scripture. Then uh, Old Testament here. Okay, so Moses writes the originals. Okay, so we call them the autographer, the original, the ones written by the original authors and so on. So autobiography, autobiography is, is written by your own self. A biography is written about you. Autobiography is something you write yourself. So the, the autographer is something that Moses wrote there and so on. Uh, and so you have the originals up to Josiah. They found the book of the law and so on, really. Then we have the fall of Jerusalem when they were taken captive and Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 BC by the Babylonians and so on. Time of Daniel and Ezra. And then copies were made right the way through to Christ. It's 400 some years between the Old and the New Testament there, between Malachi and Matthew, whatever. But so uh, we see, uh, by the time we get to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, in Matthew 4, Luke 4, he's tempted and so on. And, and um, uh, he says to Satan, it is written three times, it is written. Get grapta, it's a perfect tense verb. A perfect tense verb is something that has uh, happened in the past and it still stands today. Uh, there. So it's a perfect tense verb. For instance, uh, John 19.30, it is finished. Tetelestai, it is finished, Christ said. It's something that's finished then and it's still finished today. We don't add to it like the sacraments of some church or whatever. Uh, so you see it's important there. So um, he says, get grabbed. it is written. So it was written then and it stands written today. So that's a perfect tense verb. So, so the Lord Jesus Christ said, jots and tittles are preserved and so on. So we can categorically say on the testimony of Jesus Christ that the, the Hebrew text was preserved from Moses 
until his time. We can say that without any fear of contradiction. Somebody wants to disbelieve that, they can, uh, but we can be absolutely confident about that completely there. So we move on to the New Testament timeline then. Uh, but Psalm 1989, the word of God is forever settled in heaven. So there's no errors, omissions, scribal trans errors uh, uh, or emendations or whatever, or redactions or whatever, you know, I mean, all this stuff they use. Uh, but none of this in heaven. I mean, the word of God is there and it stands there and so on. So God gives us the word on earth. All right. So have we lost it? You see, that the whole concept behind this modern Bibles is uh, that we've lost the original Greek New Testament and through modern scholarship we're trying to recreate it. What's the problem there? Problem is if we don't have the original manuscripts how will we ever know if, if we got to recreate them? If we haven't got anything to compare it against <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. But this is what they're saying. So, I mean, how arrogant and how egotistical could we get to think that, you know, we're going to, through modern scholarship, recreate the Bible that God had in the New Testament there, and somehow it's got lost. Well, when did it get lost? When did, was it lost? How did it get lost? Who lost it? Um, so, 100 years after, say, Revelation was written, or John's gospel, John's epistles, or gospel, or whatever. Hundred years after that, was it still authoritative? Um, if not, when did it get lost, or how? Uh, Two hundred years later, was it? Was it? How about five hundred years later? Was it still authoritative then, and so on? So we get to today and say that was written for then. And we see we find this argument and um, about women preachers, <laughs> and people say all the time to us, happens all the time. Family members, friends, other people come along. Oh, well, that was for then, not for today. Or well, when did it lose that authority? When did it change? Why did it change? Who changed it? Um, you see, you've got a problem there. Did it change 30 days after it's written? Or 30 years? Or 300 years after it's written? Or whatever? I mean, did God preserve this word? And is it still authoritative today as it was then? Of course it is. So this is, a, this is the, the whole issue behind this. So, okay, so we've got the Old Testament, New Testament, 1,600 years or so. Uh, so we've got the original manuscript, the autographer, uh, but the, their translations from that we call the apographer. That's that comes from them, the apographer, the translations. So we get accurate, accurate translations here. Uh, so... God hasn't finished with his words. Uh, these translations were made into many languages based upon the Textus Receptus, the Masoretic Text Preserve. We talked about the different Bibles available uh, before in the first session, some of the older versions and so on. Now, no, if the words are, uh, are not, were not preserved, only the message, then why were the promises of John 14, 26 and John 16, 13 given? Okay, so uh, the Lord says here, John 14, 26 by the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, all right, and modern versions have Helper, not Comforter. Uh, so there's a big difference between the two. <laughs> uh, and uh, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. So there's one, um, there's several different forms of, of, of um, idea, if you like, uh, of uh, how the New Testament pr progressed then. Uh, the oral tradition became written down and things get lost over the time. We talked about Chinese whispers earlier and so on. Uh, and uh, so on, or the, the Gospel of Mark there was there and everybody copied from him and whatever. Uh, and um, there's all these different form criticisms and different things, the different types of, of, of uh, theological invented concepts and whatever. How, but, but, you know, he said the Holy Spirit is going to bring all things to your remembrance there. And um, uh, so, you know, the Apostle Paul says, I received of the Lord in Matthew, in 1 Corinthians 1.11. That which, you know, uh, that he said about the, the Lord's Supper. He received it from the Lord. He didn't get it from Peter. He didn't get it from, uh, from uh, John or anybody else. He got it from the Lord. 
Um, so we need to be mindful of these things. It's important. But um, it says in 16.13, How be the Spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself, nor whatsoever he shall hear. And he will show you things to come. So that's important. So um, uh, I show you a mystery, Paul says there. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, we should not all sleep. Sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, we, uh, we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. I show you a mystery. This is about the rapture and so on. So um, uh, it was a mystery, something wasn't known before. So, you know, uh, that soon tells me that at the time that when Christ went to heaven, Peter, John and the others didn't know about the rapture because it was revealed with the view of the Paul later on. You see, so... Um, we be mindful of all these things as we look at the uh, at the Bible. So, um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Old Testament was given into care of the Levites. The Moses wrote the law, delivered into the front of the priests of the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto all the elders of, of Israel. So, the law was delivered to the priests and the sons of Levi. The Levites were the ones who were to meant to preserve the word and teach the people. They failed, but they were meant to do that. Okay. So. Um, New Testament, Jude 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith as once delivered to the saints. Uh, Jude 3. So God used the Old Testament priests and Levites and the New Testament believer priests, every New Testament believer is a priest, a priest of all believers, to preserve his words. He did not use ecumenical councils. These merely recognized what was universally accepted as scripture by believers worldwide. Now, uh, many will say that the canon of Scripture there, the, well, they won't argue with the 66 books of the Old Testament, unless you're Catholic or whatever, then you add the apocryphal books, but the 15 and so on. But, uh, but if um, the New Testament is saying, well, you know, it didn't get formally uh, constructed until 397 AD after Christ. There's a certain council there. This. Well, the, that council didn't represent all the believers worldwide. You know, it's a really uh, sort of we started. We started to get a formation of the Catholic Church idea and so on. So, anyway, by that time, but the um, but the people say, well, the Catholic Church gave us the Bible. No, 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 no. You see, what they did was simply recognise what all the churches throughout the world, with all the believers, uh, believed was Scripture. They rejected the others, and so they uh, they wrote these books down in a list. That's all they did. Uh, these are the books that the, that, that the church has accepted because the Holy Spirit in you is the same as the Holy Spirit in, uh, in dwelling the greatest scholar <laughs> and so on. So the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we're the sons of God, for instance, Roman 8 and so on. So you see, that's why even though before I was a believer, you know, I believe God was working in my life there to show me you know, that this new English Bible wasn't, wasn't the right, it wasn't kosher. You know, I mean, but certainly as a believer, you know, I, and it's interesting, when I started my theological study, and I'm giving a lot of uh, biography here this morning, it's half new, but uh, when I started my studies there, somebody gave me a tape on Genesis to listen to that had the gap theory. And uh, it's interesting, and it says uh, the things uh, in chapter uh, 1, verse 2 of Genesis, and, and uh, the, 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 the chapter 1 says the world was without form and void, and then chapter 2 says, and became... This became it became without form and void, you see, uh, and um, uh, don't don't read that like that. But then you see, then I had another take given, which obviously follows the biblical concept there, the original six days creation, twenty four hours a day. See, and, and, and instantly you see you recognise that one, and you heard the hiss of the serpent with the first tape there because the, the gap theory. And believe me, people are going back to the. I've, we've had people visit our church here. And just a young man recently who was in the, in the um, Cold Stream Guards, you know, the ones that parade on Buck and Bannis and whatever. And he, he's a sergeant and whatever. And he, but he could lead in the gap theory. We had quite a conversation. You know, he didn't come back, but kind of thing. But, uh, but it's incredibly important. You see, Schofield Bible presents the, the gap theory, and, and uh, so um, we need to be careful with this uh, because, you see. All, all of these things then take away from the direct authority of the words of Scripture. And it's incredibly important that we understand that. So, uh, so the Holy Spirit used all the believers in all the churches there. They rejected this book, uh, the, te the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve and so on, and the Gospel of Thomas and all these other books that were written there. They, they weren't included in Scripture. 
people are turning back to those today. People are saying to me, well, we're reading these to find out what the Bible says. Well, hang on, why don't you read the Bible? <laughs> find what the Bible says. You know, and it's an astonishing thing. So, but you see, these were rejected by uh, the, the believers all over the world. So all they did was put together a list of what all of the churches believed were the right books of the New Testament, the 27 books. It wasn't given to us by the Catholic Church or an ecumenical council and so on. All they did was recognise what the whole of the churches all over the world accepted as scripture. And, and that's an important point that pe people bring up there. I've had, all these things have been brought up to me more than once. So, um, okay, so two types of texts. <clears throat> hmm. Or two streams of witnesses. There's a traditional text, also called the Received Syrian Byzantine at one time called the majority, there's confusion now, uh, and the Antiochian, uh, or called the Antiochian, Antiochian Syria, as opposed to Pisidia. But, um, and the critical text, also called the Alexandrian, the Elogian, or Western, etc., and so on. Uh, and so two different types of text. Now, the critical text is ostensibly, or roughly, basically the same as the West Gotten Hort, Nestle Island, and the United Bible Society text, etc. Now, Nestle Island, I think, is on the 28th edition, and uh, the UBS has got four editions and whatever, and so they keep changing them. Um, so, anyway, but we're, um, uh, <coughs> we're working on that. Now, the available witnesses here, this is in the Greek, all right? Uh, five and a half thousand Greek manuscripts. They're held in various libraries and museums around the world. We're going to look at some. Uh, and then 1,800 plus copies of ancient versions that are written very early on, copied from the Greek, which is important to recognize here because um, uh, particularly when somebody says this verse is not in the Bible, when we've got an ancient Italian or Latin um, or Hebrew, well, sorry, Greek or whatever, um, sorry, Coptic, uh, pardon me, a Coptic uh, that says that verse and it was written in the second century, for instance. So in other words, that verse was available to read in the second century. Uh, so it's a important witness to the fact that this is actually this verse of scripture that was there. So that's important there. So then there's a vast majority of these that substantially support the traditional text or received text and consequently the King James Bible. We have another technical issue here. Ah, okay. All right, and so the Prince of the Power of the Air is... Uh, <laughs> He doesn't like the, <laughs> the seminar. There. Okay, uh, okay. Now this is a little bit out of date because it's five and a half. But this is just following up with some information that Jack Mormon got once. Uh, five thousand two hundred fifty Greek manuscripts at that time, uh, a few years ago, were made up of the following: papyrus fragments, eighty-eight. These are very, very small fragments. Uh, sometimes it's about that tall. Very flimsy. I've seen many of them in the real life there, and. It, you know, you know, you can't get anywhere, you won't let you get anywhere near them, and so on, they fall apart. But the unctuals, these are all capital letters, 267, all right? And so examples of that would be the Vaticanus and the Sadicanus manuscript, we'll look at those. Uh, and then cursives, these are all small letters or lowercase, 2,764, and lectionaries, 2,143. So lectionaries, all they were, were individual verses copied out, like we might do to read out in a service, but they were copied in the original Greek. So therefore, they're valid witnesses. They might not be uh, the whole of John chapter 1, for instance, but there might be verses in chapter 1 of John. So we know that verse back then is a great testimony to the fact of what was actually scripture. So we find these interesting. Now, uh, if we move on here, uh, the main manuscripts that are used today by the modern versions are the Codex Vaticanus, they call it B, in the Vatican Library, and they, they, doubt that, they date that around 350 to 370 AD. Now, I'm skeptical of this. I think it's evidence now that they, these things were written much later than that. But, but anyway, the manuscript has been in the Vatican Library since 1481. It contains most of the Old Testament and most of the New Testament, except the pastoral epistles, parts of Hebrews, and Revelation. Interesting, the parts of Hebrews missing are from chapter 9 onwards. Things like, for one offering, God has perfected forever, then the come to God by him. Once in the end of the world, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice himself. They don't like that because in the Roman Catholic Mass, you're putting Christ to death every time you meet and say the Mass. 
but they but that's missing from it's interesting isn't it <laughs> this is in the Vatican manuscript so somebody obviously wanted to uh, not those those verses to be in there uh, and so there's a, a vested interest there well the Codex Sinaiticus or Aleph uh, there the uh, first uh, <coughs> uh, letter in the alphabet there uh, um, of Hebrew alphabet in the British Library and you can see that today if you go in the British Library uh, you can see up open on a page there, and again that's supposed to be written about the same time. But there's evidence, really, I think, that's written in the 18th century. But we, anyway, but we, um, uh, you know, we'll come to that another time. But this contains all or parts of the Old Testament and uh, uh, part of the Old Testament, part of all of the New Testament, plus two non-canonical books, Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermes. It was found in 1844, allegedly in a waste paper basket in St Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai. Uh, now, these two manuscripts differ from each other over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. So there's a, a really big issue there. So which one do you choose? We'll look at that later on. Okay, so um, question. Is a Greek or a Hebrew manuscript more valuable as a witness to the text and canon of Scripture than a lectionary copy of an early version or a quotation from an early church father? Early church father, all that means is somebody that wrote something then and we still got it what's written today. So that's all it means. <laughs> Nothing... Uh, uh, mystical bad it all <laughs> so um, uh, all the above have equal value in many instances as regards determining both the canon and text of scripture because we do not have the original orthographs so if they quote a verse passage back then in the second century it's going to be more valuable than some Vaticanus that's supposed to be written in the fourth century uh, because it uh, that doesn't have that verse uh, so because that verse was available 200 years before and so these are very, very valuable witnesses there. So uh, moving on here. So two streams of manuscript witnesses then. So we've got the original autographs there. Uh, and we've got the line in the middle, early versions, faithful copies, and so on. And that comes up the majority text, and then which comes up to the King James Version and other language translations like Martin Luther did uh, really. The, he, he, he used the TR text. And others have used that. Adoniram Judson in Burma used it and so on. All sorts of... Um, uh, but today they, they translated from the Texas Receptus into the language, not from the modern text. But the modern text wasn't available, of course, back then. Uh, well, it, they were written back then, they weren't used. Now, from 50 plus onwards AD, we got corruption of the Bible according to what we saw earlier, 2 Corinthians 2.17, uh, there are many that corrupt the word of God. So from, th from there we find corruptions. So we've got a stream that comes off there from the mainstream to come down to this Alexandrian or critical text here, which is the modern text, which is basically Westcott and Hort text or behind the modern uh, translations and so on. So we'll talk about Westcott and Hort in a minute. Um, now, interesting enough, we can move up the top there. AD 200 plus, Tertullian wrote that many of the original manuscripts were written, like the Ephesians manuscript to Ephesus or whatever, or Thessalonians to Thessalonica, at 200 AD, the original manuscripts were still there in those churches for people to copy from. That is very significant because, I mean, uh, so uh, obviously it wasn't lost then. <laughs> they had the original <laughs> and so on. So what we got today is copies. But, but Christ had a copy of the Hebrew. He didn't have the original. He had a copy of the Hebrew. But, so that's interesting. So uh, this is important that we, we look at these streams of manuscripts here. Uh, and now, along the top there, it's after 800 AD, which are most of, the, most of the modern manuscripts there, thousands of them were written from AD 800 onwards. Not one of them are available to uh, support the modern text. Not one. They all supported the Texas Receptus, the text behind the King James Bible. So there was all those that copied the text or the Bible at that time, copied from the original uh, King James text, not uh, from the modern text. So that's fascinating. And um, so why would that be? Clearly because they did not trust <laughs> the handful of manuscripts that uh, deviated from that, uh, even if you can trust the dating of it and so on. So uh, we'll come on a little bit more about the, the, that a little bit later on. Uh, but uh, here's a confusion. Now I've got the the first book I've got over there, I think, uh, there, just don't, don't 
you can take the blue books, but not the others. They're my personal copies, so be careful with that. So I can't afford to lose any of the books. So, um, but the books are written myself. You can take free. So, uh, but um, uh, so don't, please don't remove the others. I don't know. I got that. Oh yes, I have got it over there. Okay. So this is the Greek New Testament according to the majority text by Hodges and Farsteads, uh, the, the top one. So what we had originally, the, the text behind the King James, the, the, the text of Seth was, was called the majority text. But now we're getting other versions that are called majority text. So it's confusing the issue. So this, um, so when they look at this uh, here, uh, for instance, instead of 2,900 omissions from the uh, modern text, there's only 1,800 omissions. There's still lots of omissions here. But in the modern version, the text behind the modern versions misses out 2,900 Greek words, which is equivalent of books of First and Second Peter or Revelation and Jude, missing from the Greek. So you've got a real problem here. You know, a chunk of scriptures missing effectively, spread across the New Testament. Anyway, so the, but the modern text there is interesting. Now, they say that's the majority text. Now, other people have written things since then, they call the majority text. But this particular one there, uh, they work on a, a, um, an edition written by a chap called Hermann von Soden, a German uh, scholar of the early 1900s there. And he did a work and he collated 404, I think it was, manuscripts. Now we've got five and a half thousand manuscripts today, so he only collated nine percent, uh, roughly, of the manuscripts available. Nobody could collate them all because they were over the world, and so on. But um, so to say it's the majority text is really a misnomer because you know it's only nine percent of the available witnesses that he's used to collate this material. So one has to be careful with this. So I hope I'm making this clear. Uh, so. Um, but then we've got these other different Greek texts here that are made available. Uh, so the, the second one, the one we would use there, the Trinitarian the Bible Society produced that. Uh, and then they, they've got the Nestle Anand and, and the, uh, uh, and the, um, uh, <coughs> the UBS text, the United Bible Society text, and so on. So you've got, it's confusion out there. Confusion out there. So which one do you use? Uh, so we have these streams of witnesses. Now, in 1881, this is when the real problem started, modern problem. Two scholars called Westcott and Hort, Brooke Foss Westcott, Fenton John Anthony Hort, two Anglican scholars, produced a complete new text of the Greek Old Testament, New Testament, sorry, Greek New Testament. And they presented it to a revision committee who only thought they were going to revise the English, update the English. But then they were foisted with this new Greek texts that they, these guys have been working on for 10 years and told nobody and so on. And so one or two people resigned from that committee, but others just went along with it and got bamboozled, uh, bludgeoned into it and so on. So we ended up with a, the uh, revised version, English revised version in 1881. I have a copy of that. I bought it for a pound in a bookshop. I'm going to pay full price for it. Uh, so um, <laughs> kind of, anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not going to support these ones. Anyway, so I'm, I'm always looking for things I can get out of second-hand bookshops. Um, but um, <clears throat> anyway, um, but that really didn't, nobody really sort of went with that, but, but it was the rage at the time. In 200, 2000, uh, sorry, sorry, um, in, um, 18, in 1901, sorry, then, um, uh, then the Americans produced their own version, the American Standard Version, okay, their, their own one. All right, but very basically similar to that. But this was following the, the Greek text. This was a bombshell. This was a, a watershed. This is where really sort of everything blew apart. It had been festering and been, the movement had been going for years. But now in, the, in, a, in terms of where we're at today with the English version and all the other versions that were originally translated, but now they're not. All the other versions today are almost always translated from the new text, uh, whether it's German or French or whatever, uh, and so on. So, um, uh, yeah. So we're not to add to the word of God, we're not to mess around with it, we'll move on, we'll move on from that because I think time scale here. Uh, and uh, again, not to take away, we see that Revelation 22, we mustn't remove anything at all, add anything, so on. So I think we know these verses, so we move on for time's sake here. Uh, we we won't analyse what a witness is, but I think we'll move on from this because of the time factor. 
but um, <clears throat> uh, so Westcott and Hort text differs from the received text in 5,604 places or involves 9,970 Greek words. 2,806 Greek words are omitted by Westcott and Hort. So the so-called majority text I just said differs and received text in 1,800 places. Uh, so interesting. Now we move on. Uh, so comparison of changes from the original 1611 KJV. All right. So the New King James Version. All right. Uh, would be. Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> In the King James 1769, uh, there'd be one change for every 1,880 words. So these are very minor changes, didn't accept any doctrinal things. But the new King James it changes one for every 7.9 words changes. So from 0.5% to 12.64%. Uh, if I follow you following through with that, I haven't got too much time to spend on, on this, but uh, if, if just anyway, you can work that out. Um, okay, so now Mark's Gospel, last uh, 12 verses there of Mark's Gospel. Uh, support for the last 12 of Mark's Gospel. 18 uncials, that's the, um, uh, the um, original ones in the uh, uppercase, uppercase text, capitals. 600 cursives, lowercase, uh, there. Every lectionary, every single one, 2,143 lectionaries. 10 ancient versions, 19 quotations from church fathers uh, support the verses from Mark's Gospel. Uh, some of the modern versions are footnotes or some or some early ones or a few, uh, whatever. Uh, these are lies because the vast majority of, uh, uh, of the manuscripts available support the text behind the King James Version. That's as simple as that. So here's Codex Sinaiticus. This is the one you can see in the, not this particular slide, but you can, it's the one you can see in the... Um, uh, in the uh, British Library today. Okay, I used to have Alexandrians next to it, but last time I went there, I took some, some folks around there and they'd removed that. They'd got more Muslim texts and things and so on, so they removed some of the biblical exhibits um, from display. But here you see, this is fascinating because um, uh, here's the end of Mark's Gospel, and this is the only place in that manuscript you find this. It's, it's, it's missing here, the last 12 verses, but they left a bit of blank space here, exactly the length of those verses. Uh, so astonishing things here. And um, you can see all kinds of marks and emendations and, and corrections and things on these manuscripts anyway. Uh, fascinating. Uh, but um, So that's the uh, Codex Sinaiticus here. Now, uh, the Lord's Prayer, this is fascinating. Um, so, um, uh, thine is, we end up with, thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever, amen. It's missing in the NIV and bracketed in the New American Standard Bible. Now, the vast majority of existing witnesses, the manuscripts include these verses. And there is a great deal of other ancient evidence, versions, lecturers, quotations, old church fathers, etc. The Greek-speaking church have always retained it as the next slide shows. shows. So, if we move on here, okay, uh, it's a bit difficult to see here, but um, this is in a Greek museum, Greek Orthodox Museum in St. Augustine, Florida, the oldest city in America. And uh, we were there um, on our honeymoon, and we walk in, we saw this, we went in there, and in, uh, as you go through, they got the very different sort of uh, exhibits and whatever, and you come through into this room, it's got white, like, white -like marble type walls. And on either side were what we call interlinear, uh, text, Greek, English, Greek, English, Greek, English. One had the Lord's Prayer and the other had uh, the Apostles' Creed. Okay, with well this, so I took a picture of the, I tried to take some pictures of this uh, and it was difficult because, you know, I had it back here, this is as wide as the room is uh, and so on, so my camera's not that great. Uh, so anyway, uh, we went back a second time years later and tried to get an improvement. Uh, anyway, but this is a Greek text of, um, uh, of the um, Lord's Prayer with Greek, English, Greek, English. Now, it's not showing up dark on here. Um, when I show it with a projector on the screen, it comes out really bright. Uh, but um, uh, let's get a, a, a magnified version of it here. Okay. It could be the light. It could be the light. Yeah, it could be the light. Uh, ah, that's better, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah. Okay, you see that there? Uh, and... Um, 
Uh, so we've got the bottom there. This is line of the kingdom and so on. Um, he could see it really clearly here, blowing up there. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. So here they've got this written. Now this was originally uh, from um, <clears throat> these people, I think the 1600s or so, they moved to get a better, about 400 or so Greeks moved to get a better life and they set up this here and, and so on. So they, see the Greek church have always, have always um, churches have always maintained the, uh, the text here, whereas in the West it was changed. It was removed. Thine is the king of the power and the glory. So Mark's gospel there, if you read the foot, even in the New King James, they've got a question mark at the bottom there about the validity of these verses and so on. So it's important that we recognize this. So these are clearly, the witnesses are overwhelming for these verses here in Mark's gospel. So we move on. And okay, so um, that's just the, the text underneath there. It's talking something. So, okay. So important statistics here. Well, I think we'll move on from this because uh, we've had enough statistics for the time being. Uh, but so where did the received text tradition begin? Okay, so John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me receiveth, not my words, uh, have one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. I think it's important we understand receiving the Lord, receiving that. And I, I don't argue with people and so on. I know what they mean. But I'd rather say, you know, receive Christ rather than accept Christ. Receive Christ rather than accept. If you think it through, uh, I prefer to say that, received. Uh, because, you know, he that receiveth my word receiveth me and so on, and, and my Father that sent me and so on. So we, we find this concept in Scripture here. But, but, um, <clears throat> but, uh, John 7, 8, and 20, I've given unto the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, have known, surely I come out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me, and so on. Acts 2, 41, Jews received his word. Samaritans, Acts uh, 11, 1, received his word. Uh, Gentiles, Acts 17, 11, received his word. The Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, they received the word of God. So the whole idea of the received text is that these texts that the people that trusted the Lord received these words. There is that, in fact, the text it means the, the text that's received all. And so it was first used, the term was first used in the 16th century there, but nevertheless, the text of the scriptures, it goes back to the whole idea of what the New Testament says about receiving the word of God consistently the Jews, the Samaritans, the Gentiles all receive the word of God. And it's important that we, we you know, so uh, it's something that we, we, we accept, we receive it. Now, you know, of course we accept it all, but receiving is much more probably correct and, and much stronger and, and representative uh, meaning there. Uh, but this is what, the, what we find there, the received text. So now where did the modern critical text begin? The majority or small majority of manuscripts and papyrus fragments that we have available to us today give more support to the modern or critical Greek text, basically that of Westcott and Hall at 1881, than they do the text as receptors or received texts, formerly known as the majority text. However, nearly all of these manuscripts come from Alexandria in Egypt, where so many errors and heresies were developed, and these documents exhibit very great differences among themselves. Porn point, remember, is this area is very dry or arid and lacks humidity, Hence, the conditions are very conducive to preserving this fragile writing materials, whereas in many other conditions, it would be exactly the opposite. They reverse there. So that's fascinating there. So um, uh, just um, so many, nearly all of the, the small variety, the small number of texts behind the modern versions, maximum 45 manuscripts, maximum 45 manuscripts uh, would come from that area in Egypt there where it's very dry and you can preserve these manuscripts and so on so uh, that's interesting there so um uh yeah okay so dean john william bergen referred to earlier there and uh i recommend his books to read because we're not accepting his anglican theology in other areas but in terms of the text he was absolutely brilliant and so um uh so anyway he he was the one that really wrote that book the, re the revision revised there uh, there, so I'm not sure if I've got it over there. Mayhem. Uh, anyway, so he, um, I think I have. 
Uh, but anyway, that was the one we spoke about earlier with Dr. Wake getting convicted and so on. So, but he, he passionately uh, opposed Westcott and Hort. There. So um, these modern versions. Right, manuscripts available. <clears throat> Most of these are supporting the modern versions there. Not always do they support them. Sometimes they support both the modern versions and the original text of Sceptus. So um, uh, this, uh, sometimes they support both. But this, but, um, we'll go on to that. This is P75, Papyrus 75, showing the end of Luke's Gospel, the beginning of John's Gospel, and so on. Uh, very fragile, you see. Uh, you wouldn't be allowed to touch it. <laughs> uh, if you, those who do touch it wear white gloves and <laughs> whatever, and, uh, you, know, and you, you couldn't have strong light over it or anything else like that and uh, whatever. You'll be very, very careful. Uh, what we've got today are facsimiles of these, which is interesting because that enables everybody to see the originals uh, and uh, thought, see these do documents. But um, so, uh, without um, you know, diminishing, without damaging them. So that's good. So uh, this is in Martin Bob Library in Geneva, Switzerland, and sign permission given. And so um, again, P66, same same um, for Geneva, there around about 200 and showing the beginning of John's Gospel and so on. So um, uh, these are very fragile. You can see all their, their, their four into bits here, uh, but uh, astonishing thing now. Uh, so these are, um, these are written in uh, small letters, small case letters there. Uh, others were, the, we might show the Califanders, the Vandias and Vaticanas were written in, in, in uppercase letters. Okay, so this is the oldest recognized or acknowledged Scrap of, of uh, papyrus here. This is in John Ryland's museum uh, in Manchester or the University Library in Manchester, England. Here, so um, just up the road. And um, this is dated 125 to 150 AD. So it's written on both sides. So they did that too, obviously, because these are hard to get hold of, these manuscripts. But you see there, in actual fact, it is... Um, about that tall and about that wide. Tiny little fragment here. Um, astonishing, uh, but has, uh, you can see the, um, that's the one side and then there's the other side of it, uh, what's written on there. So bits from John's Gospel there. But interesting, dated 125 to 150 AD. Uh, so um, uh, just, uh, What's this book that Dan Brown's written? The um, uh, oh dear, the, what would they? Oh, it's gone out of my mind now. The uh, Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci Code. There we go. That's the one. Huh? I, I, haven't, I haven't read it, but I know they said about it. A lot of rubbish. Uh, but um, <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, he has I think John's Gospel written in third or three hundred or four hundred years after Christ or something, and so on. So. Um, Anyway, if this is valid dating, that's about 200 years before he says it was written. <laughs> so kind of thing. So, you know, but people read that junk and then they, they, they just take it in. Movie yeah, there is a movie. I've never seen it. Uh, so, um, is it? Okay, you're an expert on it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to, not going to pay to uh, support the the devil's text. <laughs> so. All right, well, there you go. Uh, and this is in Dublin, just a bitty uh, movement, uh, library in Dublin. And uh, I've been there several times. And so this is P45, and it's an older date. So it's showing about Matthew 25, uh, 41 to 26, and so on. Uh, and uh, again, used probably. But these are very small fragments, so I know. So there are fragments on available there, but I actually asked for some of these, and they paid them and they send them to me and whatever and we put them on so um are yeah papyrus, pardon are they, papyrus? they are papyrus they are papyrus yeah which is made out of the reeds on the nile and whatever uh, and the vellum is is scraped hides from animals and so on very expensive and so on we can mention that in a minute when we talk about palimpsest but kind of um uh, so yeah uh, fascinating here um again p46 in chester beady there around about 250 AD, they say, and it's containing books of Acts and so on. So fascinating. And again, these support mostly the Northern versions, but a reasonable percentage of supports the, the, um, uh, the TR text. 
The Vaticanus is the uh, uh, public enemy number one uh, there. So Codex Vaticanus there about that. They say it's fourth century. So anyway, this is what, uh, what it's saying there. Uh, and so this is just in the Vatican Library, but um, uh, of course you'd have to get special permission to see it. Uh, now this manuscript uh, is missing the following New Testament passages. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Revelation, Hebrews 9, 14 onwards. Uh, critical verses missing from this manuscript include 1 Timothy 3, 16, God was manifest in the flesh. And so um, it doesn't even, their flags, this is their blue ribbon manuscript. And it doesn't support them, the one, one uh, Timothy 3, 16. Hebrews 9, 26 onwards, which we've spoken about, and these other verses in Hebrews, once in the end of the world, he will appear to put away sin and so on, forever and so on. But one offering is he perfected forever and so on. They're missing from it. Uh, so they can't... Yes, exactly, yeah. And um, then, um, and of course, it's missing the entire book of Revelation, which is interesting. Uh, so it can't be a witness to anything uh, the modern, as the text says on Revelation, which is interesting. Uh, so, um, yeah. And here's the Codex Alexandrinus. This is also um, in the British Library, but they've stopped showing it now. The last time I went there, did anyway, but I've seen it down there. Um, uh, showing a table of the books of the New Testament on the left, and the beginning of John's Gospel on the right here. So these are sort of what's available to, to look at. These are all capital letters here, all unctuals on these ones. And so these will be written on, on uh, vellum, not on papyri. So that's uh, as I mentioned. So that's um, uh, very expensive stuff, of course. And so there's a comparison there of Alexandrus and Codex Sinaiticus uh, shown side by side and so on. So um, uh, fascinating things here. Uh, these are what, what you're working with. Uh, but you notice all kinds of marks on the side there and, and little uh, notes and stuff. And, and uh, Codex Bize, uh here, the 5th century, um, uh, showing the beginning of John's Gospel. Uh, Matthew 16, 2 is present and not marked as doubtful or spurious. So it's interesting. That should be Mark 16, maybe. Oh, no, Matthew 16, sorry, yeah. The longer end of Mark is given. Luke 22, 43. And... Um, now, this is just technical terms, the pericope de adulterer, which means the story of the adulteress there in uh, John uh, are present and not marked as spirits. Also uh, doubtful, John 5, 4 is omitted. Uh, so um, the, the pericope, whatever there, is, 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 the John, is the John's Gospel, where, eight, where the woman taken in adultery, and that's missing. John 7, 53 to 8, 12 is, is missing from the, or according to the question in the modern Bibles there. So... Uh, that's interesting. Um, so, Codex Ephraimi, Ephraimi or Ephraimi, uh, this, is, um, this is actually a palimpsest. Palimpsest is, um, uh, they had the original material, very expensive, and so they would actually wash or scrape it off, some old text, to put a new text on top of it. So you can see, you can see the other text underneath here. So that's, um, you can see that there? Uh, so it's, it's a bit difficult to read, isn't it? <laughs> What's, why is that a different type of writing than the other one? Well, because it'd be older, older and so they, they take an old man thing and then they scrape it all off or wash it off with some kind of stuff and then, uh, but it wouldn't remove it completely and then because they put the new text on top of it because the, the material was so expensive they couldn't afford to keep you, you know, getting new material. So that's fascinating. So it's called a palimpsest there. So... Um, Again, these are things that, uh, you know, show the difficulty of transmission. Their early days there with availability of materials and so on. So, um, but this again uh, is interesting. Now, I'm going to refer to all these later on if we've got time, uh, as uh, which witnesses to certain events and so on. Now, a comparison of the number of syllables used by the King James Version and other translations and so on. So, uh, in Luke 18.3, avenge me. In the King James becomes in the New American Standard Bible, give me legal protection. So avenge me is not the same as give me legal protection, but it also is a lot longer there if you see there are many more syllables. James 5.15, prayer of faith shall save the sick, uh, as becomes the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. Uh, so again, very lengthy uh, modern versions were amazed in Mark 16.8 becomes astonishment to grip them. And so on. So um, again, much longer. Law of the leper becomes regulation for the diseased person. 
at the end of it, it is 14.2, and that's uh, um, in the NASB, uh, and um, the, that one, the bottom one's from the NIV. Uh, so, again, as Jack Mormon says, it's shorter, less Greek words, but longer in the English. And um, by the way, to get a, I was going to mention about copyrights earlier. All the modern versions are copyright. They're copyrighted by some owner. King James was a royal patent, only for functioning in England uh, at that time. So anywhere else in the world, you could produce it. So it was never copyrighted. So that's a, a false claim that people say. Now, to get a copyright, you have to have at least 5,000 changes from something else. So when the new King James comes along, it has to have at least 5,000 changes. They have to change something just to make sure to get the copyright. So that's a fascinating uh, truth there. So uh, interestingly enough. So here again, Revelation uh, 22, 19, Book of Life becomes Tree of Life in the modern versions. So the Greek uh, text has Kulu tree instead of Biblu book. Is this important? I believe it is. Tyndale had Book of Life and so on. And the New King James Version actually has retained it in capitals, Book of Life. So there's all kinds of inconsistencies here. But, but why would the Lord have the universal reading Book of Life for nearly 400 years, which include the Reformation, the Great Revivals, and so on, quote, unquote, only to have it changed to the Tree of Life by modern scholars and so on. So, well, yes, books are made from trees, that's for sure. Well, mostly. Uh, not necessarily all today, but mostly. Uh, huh? No, no, it doesn't make sense at all, does it? So, um, um, Isaiah 14, 12. King James, how they've fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, becomes, in the New American Standard, or the NIV, O star of the morning, O morning star. But Revelation 22, 16 says that Jesus is the bright and morning star. So Jesus is the morning star, not Satan. Uh, so again, this is serious stuff. You get that? That's uh, amazing. So, um, all right, and then uh, we've got um, uh, let no man beguile your reward in voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding those things which he hath not seen, uh, here Colossians 2.18, vainly puffed up with his fleshly mind, becomes, in the New American Standard Bible, he has seen. So he has definitely not seen. There, so we've got the uh, uh, ad, uh, adverb there, not, uh, there. Um, and it's missing. So it completely reverses the order. So we see there that Colossians was written to confute uh, uh, Gnosticism. Uh, very interesting. So it talks about uh, intruding the things he has not seen, but they're talking about things he has seen. So this is where we're getting this. this well, I've seen this today, I've seen that today, and whatever. If anybody says they've seen Jesus Christ today, they're flying in the face of Scripture. 1 Peter, Peter 1 says, uh, verse 8, Whom having not seen, you love. Whom having not seen, you love. Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, Last of all, he was seen of me, as one born out of due time. Last of all, he was seen of me. And so on. So, interesting in John 20, when Thomas wasn't there, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, and he said, I'm not going to believe in him unless I put my hand in the nail prints and the, and the my fingers, hands in the spear wound and so on. Uh, next chapter, he appears, uh, Lord, and Thomas is there, and he said, Thomas, put you forth. He said, he said blessed are those who have not seen, not seen, you know. Um, I, I have a message I preach, beware of sign seekers, seekers today. And, uh, you know, the Bible says that, you know, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign there. And it's interesting, there were signs and wonders rubbish today and stuff. And so we want to be careful with this. But um, here you see that he has seen, so uh, well, I've seen all these things and so on, and, uh, but um, it's warning against that. Well, listen, we don't even get anywhere near that because we have not seen these things and so on. So um, uh, even if you're a Satan worshipper or whatever, he's not talking about that here. So, um, uh, okay. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Okay, this is a, a comparison with the... Um, uh, okay, this is the same thing here with the NIV. It's just on two different slides here. Okay, uh, now, not, you see the word not, is found the large majority of manuscripts, including Codex Euphrami, 5th century there, 
uh, which we looked at, the palimpsest there, codex C, uh, so there, and um, Bizet, is it? No, codex Bizet, yeah. It's, and only missing in P46 Aleph and B and A, uh, so these four manuscripts, uh, but every other manuscript has not in it. So the vast majority of manuscripts, not the few older manuscripts as the modern versions say, but the vast majority of manuscripts support the King James text. So moving on here, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, become through him, through him, through him, in the modern versions. Even the New King James, the marginal note, enu, him, or ku, uh, and, but it's only supported by three manuscripts there, Aleph, B, and A, which we looked at earlier. So that's Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, and, and, um, uh, and Sinaiticus. Uh, but they're the only ones that actually uh, uh, have um, uh, him uh, as opposed to Christ. So a lot of difference between the Christ and, and this uh, pronoun him. All right, so they do capitalize it in the new American Standard Bible, but that's still not the point. Uh, so um, him could be anybody. Him could be anybody, you know. So, um, uh, you know, moon is and sun and moon, away, follow him and on the Messiah and whatever, you know. And so he marries, marries 6,000 couples at one go. And <laughs> Quarter of a million people in his church there, and so also because he's dead now. But, but you know, people follow these people, and, and so on. it could be anybody, could be anybody, you know. So, um, no, it's through Christ which strengthened me. So, that's uh, important there. So, we got these modern versions coming, and then uh, move on here. Uh, comparison verses. So, missing verses in the international version. Most of these are missing, and the other ones are too. So, all these verses there are missing completely in the new international version. So uh, 17, I think, there. And there are hundreds of other portions and names and words omitted, plus some added, or according to question four, those are all modern Bibles, including the New King James there. And so one has to be careful uh, with these uh, things there. For instance, instead of Lord Jesus Christ, it'll just say Lord Jesus, whatever, leave Christ off, and so on. It's, uh, it's just removing stuff all the time, removing stuff all the time. It's just working away at it, just trying to... Uh, to, then there'll be more versions to come out and they'll remove more. Uh, and then there will be, then the, the latest scholarship says this. And, the, and then, oh, this, this is the very latest thing and, and so on. This is the real deal and so on. You've got to go out and spend uh, 20 pounds on this Bible and, and whatever. And so, you know, they're just going to nibble away at the Word of God there. So, um, okay. Uh, New American Standard Bible, their footnotes. For instance, Matthew 17, 21 and Matthew 18, 11 says many manuscripts do not contain this verse. Okay, but then if we compared that with what we said over there, the majority text there, that Hodges and Fast had there, that even that's not perfect. Uh, but it would tell you that um, uh, the information given, according to both Hodges and Fast, there would be... Um, Aleph, B, and, and, and just two manuscripts versus the vast majority of manuscripts. So uh, it says many manuscripts do not contain this verse. In other words, read, if it says many, read two. Read two, not many. Uh, that's a lie. This is just downright deception. And so this is not good. So there are many other typical examples and hundreds found in modern Bibles there. And, and just people wouldn't pick that up. I mean, you can't have all the information in front of you to just pick it up and you just accept it. Okay, so comparison of versions. I think we'll have to skip some of these for time factor here. Um, uh, but uh, Genesis 3.15, thy seed and her seed between your offspring and hers and so on. So could that, that could be uh, uh, plural or anything. Could be uh, just uh, astonishing things there. So this is a new international version. It was really bad. Um, how did this one, Hebrews 11.11, 11, uh, New International Version, by through faith Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, was delivered child, because she judged him faithful who had promised, become, or became, I should say, I was going to call it by, by faith, Abraham, not Sarah, even though he was past age, and uh, Sarah herself was barren, but because he, not she, uh, considered him faithful. Uh, so it changes Sarah to Abraham. And there's not a single manuscript of the world of any language, any language at all that says uh, Abraham, not one. So they use a technical argument to try and say it was Sarah. 
Now I checked this out and um, the latest version of NIV I looked at, I corrected it and put it back the other way. <laughs> Just astonishing. Pardon? Well, they keep changing. They keep changing. Yeah. How many editions do you think the NIV I'm not sure. It's a good question. I can't answer that one, to be honest. But um, anybody know? Fun? 1978 when it first came out. Yeah. Uh, so there have been all sorts of changes that have been made there. This is one of the most classical ones that's been changed. So uh, but they, when I... Uh, what I do, I, I'll look at these ones. I, I, for instance, the Gideon Bible, they, they used to have, the, I, they find them now, and they use NIV now instead of the King James. And, and sometimes they use New King James, but, they, but anyway, but, um, so I pick them up, I look in the, when I'm at a, in a hotel, I look in the Bible, and I check that out there, and so I don't have to keep buying these, <laughs> these books. Uh, but, um, so yeah, I thought, oh, could that's been put back in. But there's millions of Bibles out there, was it missing or changed? Yeah. You know, I mean, the damage is already done, really. And you never see the headlines on these, by the way. You know, it's like evolution. You get a headline, say, brothers. Yeah, I, I read a while back that um, the NIV have actually, actually translated it into Greek. Yeah. 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 Astonishing things, and uh, actual fact, they claim that about the King James Bible as well, but but that's another story. But it's um, but all this kind of nonsense comes out. It's it's fascinating, really. Yeah, it's amazing. So um, <laughs> yeah, uh, astonishing things. So they, were there. they had a grammatical argument. I checked it in the commentaries, and uh, but um, uh, that's astonishing there because there's, no, there's not even a single manuscript that supports it. So they do change things around and then they, they differ with themselves and so on, yeah. It's a minefield out there. Ah, so we, uh, we, oh, we can't go on too many because I, I, I kind of uh, I need this time factor here. Um, so um, let's go on to the next one here. Uh, where were you? Oh, I'm going too fast here. Oh, I'm beating the computer. That's got to be good, isn't it? So, Anybody beat the computer at chess? Uh, so. uh, New American Standard Bible. Okay, um, uh, and s most of these are similar in the modern. So, oh, it's catching up. Oh dear. All right. Uh, Got to go back a few. You ready? Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Luke 24, 51, the American Standard Version. Came to pass when he blessed him, was parted from heaven and carried up into heaven. Carried up into heaven. Compared this with the New American Standard Bible, some editions, some editions, <laughs> all right, came about that while he was blessing them, he parted from them, was not carried up to heaven, is missing. Footnote reads, some manuscripts add was carried up into heaven. Aha, uh -huh, problem here. The correct phrase and carried up into heaven is found in manuscripts this is A, B, their manuscript, their main manuscript has got it in, C and E, all them, and Texas Reset, most other witnesses, and every, every Latin copy. Phenomenal. Only Aleph, that's Sinaiticus, and, and there's a corrector that's worked on that, it's got the passage, and D, their uh, Bize, got to be read differently. Uh, why would the translation committee render it differently when even Vaticanus opposes them? What right or authority do they have to make this judgment? No, NIV and other modern versions include these words. So in that instance there, the NIV is correct. Uh, bad as though it is. And so they differ among themselves there. Now, note on Luke 24, 51. You see, now we come to Acts 1, 1 and 2. Luke says, Dr. Luke, the former Vitae, Gospel of Luke that is, I put that in, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So Luke says he included an account of Jesus' ascension, but they have left it out. So uh, we have the, in, the inspired record that Luke wrote um, refuting uh, the modern scholars here. Uh, you see that? So that's important. 
And then uh, they they had wor they worshipped him. We worshipped to be removed removed from there, and um, uh, just um, again, this is interesting. The American Standard Bible says worshipped him. Have returned to Jerusalem with great joy. This is the end of Luke's gospel. Here again, the other modern versions include it against the, key, the New American Standard that excludes it. So, um, worshipped him as overwhelming manuscript support, but the NSB translator omitted these words in opposition to most other versions. So, again, there's this opposition between even the modern versions there. Well, which one do I prefer? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's crazy. So, all right. Um, and uh, here, here again, they say this in John 7, 8 and so on. And some of these are similar for the other versions too. He said, I go not up yet. See, we've got the adverb yet unto his, uh, to this feast. For my time is not yet fully come. Uh, and, uh, but it's missing yet. It's missing a new, new American Standard Bible and others. So notice that yet is missing from the NASB that makes Jesus alive because he later did go up to the feast. So the NASB omits this word because, it, but even though it's found in B, their favourite manuscripts there. So um, P6675, these early ones, and the vast majority of other manuscripts. The only major manuscript to exclude the word is Alex, uh, Aleph or Sinaiticus, which was seen this again. Was a, they they picked that manuscript out against all the others. So here they're just picking one manuscript in opposition to every other one, and to leave it out. Astonishing. And when you've got not there, it changes the whole meaning. There, so um, astonishing things here. So yeah, one is even Christ. Um, we believe that what, what's gone wrong here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, hmm. I'm not sure something's gone out of line there somewhere. Okay, this happens with this technical stuff. Um, all right, well, there's, there's bits of Christ that are missing there, <laughs> references to Christ and so on. So let's move on because that one's a bit out of line. Uh, and now Frank Logston was the main uh, motivator behind the New American Standard Bible, Frank Logston. And um, he wrote to his former, former friend, uh, and uh, doctor, uh, that um, <clears throat> had produced this, uh, the New American Standard Bible, and, and um, he said, I'm in trouble here. Now, what he did, he'd read this book by Dr. David Otis Fuller, which is the Witch Bible, which is uh, one over there, I think I've got one over there. Uh, there, And um, so he wrote, um, uh, he, he read that and he got convicted. Now, he wrote to his wife, he said to his wife, I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord, I cannot refute these arguments. He was honest. Concerning the New American Standard Version, he said it's wrong, it's terribly wrong, it is frightfully wrong, and I do not know what I'm going to do about it. And to Frank Lockman of the Lockman Foundation, which owns the copyright of the NSV, and he said, you'll always be my friend, but I can no longer ignore the criticisms, I cannot refute them, and dear brother, I have not a thing against you, but the only thing I can do under God is to renounce every attachment to the New American Standard Bible Society. And so, uh, there's a reference to the quote there. But So, he push for it to be promoted. Then he read the Rich Bible, or, or from, you know, Matt Fuller, I can't remember, anyway, but he, um, but he, um, he got convicted. He said, I have to disassociate myself from it completely. See, this is what we have to do. We have to be honest. We see the information here. Are we going to then go away and objectively think about that? What is truth and what is not truth? Or we're going to stay with a prejudice there, or just go with the flow and not be offended, not offend anybody. Uh, basically, that's what it boils down to here. So we're going to take a stand on these things and so on. So bless him for doing that, honest scholar there, and somebody you can respect. And we thank thank the Lord for that. So um, <clears throat> uh, Philippians two eight, and King James became obedient unto death, becomes to the point of death. In these others, oh, you know, lots of people say, "Well, Jesus didn't die; he was substituted on the cross there, or he he uh, fainted and they resuscitated him, or whatever." There, oh no, he became under death, not the point of death. All right, there's a serious, serious error here, and the the, the NIV correctly translates under death. 
Even the New King James has got it wrong. So again, there's this difference between the version, but the New King James, everybody's singing about that and so on, but there's all kinds of problems. In fact, it's more dangerous because people feel that this is the, like the King James for just updated and whatever, but it's embraced some of the, these errors and heresies of the modern versions and texts and so on. So um, now it's interesting, and of course uh, I'll be hauled into court now, but um, uh, on the original... Um, translation there, the English uh, version, the original back in 81, there was a, a um, sorry, the NIV. On the NIV, there was a, Virginia Mollenkopf was a, a English consultant and she was a lesbian. Right. Yep. And nine members of the NIV committee also worked on the new King James. Now, I wouldn't trust their judgment. Anyone would work, you know, under those conditions or whatever you see. What is the motive behind all this? Why is this all happening? You know, there's a reason here. You can hear the hiss of the serpent. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is really what, this is why it's happening. That's incredibly important there. So, you know, even the New King James, the point of death there, well, there's no point <laughs> in writing that. I mean, there is a point in writing that because they, you see these, these Bibles, modern Bibles, could be accepted by Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Buddhists, Catholics, you name it, JWs. Uh, they all, you see, they're not going to offend anybody. They're going to uh, mold with, the, the, you know, and even if the, you see, and, and as things move on, it will get more and more that way. I mean, I'm expecting more translations, the Lord doesn't come. Expecting more translations to come out there, and they'll take this away and that away. And oh, the latest discoveries, and so on. And the latest scholarship says this, and so on. And, and um, some of the most well known and popular and um, respected people there wrote, for instance, uh, uh, oh dear, was it the, from the Bob Jones faculty? That was the book that, that um, oh dear, I'm just getting my books here, but uh, they wrote about the. Um, yeah, from the mind of man to the mind of God. Thank you, dear. Yes, from the mind of God to the mind of man. Sorry. They've written this book and so on. And um, uh, just um, uh, J.B. Williams wrote the uh, foreword there. I was surprised because he'd spoken our church once. And, and, uh, but he said that West Scotland Hawk was saved men. And I don't believe that. I do not believe that. And uh, seeing what they've caused here. Um, but um, merry worshippers as well. Ghost, ghostly guilty they belong to I mean I don't believe they were Christians at all but um, anyway so uh, just astonishing things but they, so you know we, we see this these people on there in fact on the original 1881 committee there was a um, a Unitarian one who denied the Trinity so again you see that there's a, a hiss of the serpent here you know and um, see, it comes down to quote unquote scholarship, not spiritual qualities here, which is really important. So we see this here. So move on uh, and so on. So here's the, the New King James Version. And um, we just uh, become the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor becomes the righteous, should choose his friends carefully. Well, that's not, that's not what it says. Um, here, the preparation of the heart in man, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So it becomes the preparation of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Uh, so again, uh, the Lord's, um, everything about the Lord there becomes transferred to man and so on. So um, you see, again, this is all, uh, all, all coming. All things are made by him there. John 1, 3 became through him again. In, uh, this is the uh, New King James. So... Uh, that could be anybody. Uh, yeah, that could mean, um, I mean not cr through him means you don't have to accept that Christ is God to accept that. The second birth of the Trinity, you, you could accept it's done through him, but not by him, and so on. So again, this is this is a classic denial of theology. Um, Sodomites become perverted ones in some places in the New King James. Hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. So, exactly. 
you know, I, I, a year ago, I'm not claiming anything here, but I mean, I'm sure I'm the only one. A year ago or so, I thought I said to some of our folks, I said, you know, it won't be long before some, some minister there says that paedophiles are not um, perverted people. They're, they're sick people. Within a month of saying that, uh, an Anglican bishop came up and said the same thing. Hmm? Yeah. And now I'm not saying anything there. I mean, I'm, you know, you don't prophesy today. I mean, it's just a, you just know what's happening here and so on. Uh, and just again, just recently, I've heard this come out from a Catholic theologian, I think, and some other. Some of them. So this is this is starting to come out now that paedophiles there. We've got to we've got to understand these people. Yes, we we need to understand them there. They're sin, sin, sinners, and they need saving. <laughs> but I mean, but uh, but you know, oh, they're not criminals. They're not criminals. Exactly. That's exactly what they're doing. Exactly. And, and yeah, ex precisely. Exactly. So you see what's happening here, and so on. And so all of this is affecting the translations <laughs> here. So uh, see, I expect the modern world version is going to find even more uh, things. Now, sometimes it still says sodomites. Sometimes it still says it. Um, uh, it's also changed in these other verses here, but not all the verses. But it won't be long before all the verses are removed. <laughs> there, and it's just a question of the incremental change here. But why do they, you know, the Bible says Sodomite for a reason. It's for a reason there. These are the classic, um, you know, example of perverting God's creation. Really, and the Bible used that as a reference point there, uh, and so um, a not perverted one, or perverted persons there in Paul in the second verse. So, so that's important. So then we move on here, and just uh, just a few more, and uh, I think we will just uh, have to come on to the the end here. Uh, just, let's catch up here. Um, uh, there's more we could look at there, but um, yeah. Okay, we got here. Uh, let's just skip some more of these because you can see the general trend of it all there. But um, I want to get on to some things at the end here. Um, how many? Okay, um, we've already looked at some of these verses. Um, yeah, we've looked at some of these verses earlier. Okay, um, clearest verse of the Bible respect to the Trinity, the incarnation of Christ, and believers' baptism are all missing or according to question footnotes of virtually all modern Bibles. So 1 John 5, 7, uh, witness to the Trinity. That's the most hotly contested verse in the Bible. 1 Timothy 3, 16, God was manifest in the flesh, becomes he. And then Acts 37 is removed. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, Philip said, if thou believest all in the heart, thou mayest be baptized. And he also believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's missing in the modern versions. So again, these three key verses there are missing and so on. So important that we recognize that. Um, or just the evidence for these verses being included. So, so this, let me just quickly talk about this one. The so-called text types here. Um, <coughs> we see what they're saying here. I'm keeping an eye on the time here. Uh, but... Um, uh, the maximum support for modern versions, less than 1% of the manuscripts available, was 45 manuscripts. So over 5,460 support sorry, manuscripts, or 99% support the text behind the King James Bible here. So, but what they do is they produce what they call these groups. This, this came from Alexandria, this is Western, and so on. They're little groups. That, they divide this four in, up in these little groups, and they say, well, this is this tradition versus that tradition. What they don't tell you is this is less than 1% and that's 99%. That's what they don't tell you. But they're trying to make that equal by talking about these things. And this is a very academic, what we call gymnastics. Uh, so um, uh, one has to be careful with these things. Um, now, this is interesting thing uh, put together here because Textual support for the two streams of manuscripts. So the Alexandrian stream, behind the modern Greek text, going to 8500, no copies made after that. But then it comes up to Westcott and Hort, and they start producing this stuff, you see. Now, uh, 
Um, <clears throat> on the traditional text stream, we, we got uh, the original text there, and then Erasmus Greek uh, text in 1516, and they say he only possessed seven copies. James White and all these other debates against the King James, they say he only, present, only had seven copies of, this manus of Greek manuscripts. But he examined many more. He had friends all over Europe. He had a friend, Bombastius, in the Vatican. He could uh, contact and he could check all these things. Pardon? Didn't he have a library? Yeah, he did. And, uh, but he travelled hundreds of miles in different libraries and across Europe and looked at all these manuscripts. And a brilliant mind. Brilliant mind there. And uh, so on. So he examined many more. Well, these texts were refined by Elzevir, Steerens, and Bees, and so on, and we talked about that, that. But here's the key point here. Because of the extant Greek manuscripts available in our... Well, that's, we're in the 21st uh, century, aren't we now? So, yeah. Uh, so these 5,500 copies, so over, of which of 98% or so support the TR or uh, Erasmus there. So modern texts... Uh, are supported only by 45 manuscripts, usually less than seven, sometimes only one, occasionally none, occasionally none. Um, so, Westcott and Hort, this text here, uh, have only got 45 manuscripts supporting it. But 98, 99% of the manuscripts supporting the King James there are represented in the seven copies that Erasmus had. So, in actual fact, you only, if he only has seven copies, but they all represent the thousands we've got today, it didn't matter if he didn't have these thousands of manuscripts. <laughs> you see, so, and of course he had more than seven that he could refer to, but you see, so these are, these are technical academic arguments that don't hold water, but they persuade people. And this is why we need to do more seminars like this. It's so important that we do these things and so on. So if you've seen it several times, that my poor wife has to sit there and, and suffer it again. So uh, bless her. And uh, it's got a special reward in heaven, dear. Uh, so um, extra big crown. <laughs> and uh, just uh, the crown of long sufferance, I think we're going to do this. <laughs> so, okay. Um, all right, bless you there. So, okay. Uh, so the warns against tampering, we know these verses against tampering of the text, so on. Reasons why errors may not be errors at all, uh, and this I referred to that book, these so-called errors by Dr. Koulis there. Well, sometimes parallel accounts are not really parallel. In other words, they're referring to different aspects or different things. Sometimes the reader is so far removed from the background of the account, the alleged imperfections are due to the ignorance of the reader. Often careful reading alleviates this description. See, that's mostly at times. Sometimes not enough material is made available from the text to enable an accurate judgment to be made. Or in all cases, God must be given the benefit of the doubt rather than just cast a shadow on his character. So there's one text that says 23,000 were killed in one day. Another text says about the same thing, 24,000 were killed. But the 24,000 were killed were over a period of the whole battle which lasted more than a day. But the 23,000 was in one day alone. So there's no discrepancy amongst the Bible if you read it correctly. But when you just read that one verse, and then you read the other verse, and you forget the fact it's one battle that went over a day, then you say, well, there's a problem there. There's an error. There wasn't an error at all. It was very accurate. And so kind of, you know, these things, uh, they come about there. So interesting. Um, <clears throat> well, final points for consideration then. If we were hold to the received texts are wrong, then we're only denying modern scholarship. If the critical text advocates are wrong, they in danger of denying we're in danger of denying the very word of God. That's as simple as that, really. So we're not in danger at all if we follow the modern text, because God had that for hundreds of years and so on. Uh, if, as in modern text, we certainly cannot know for sure the exact text of Scripture, then why do they carefully do word studies, exegesis of Greek and Hebrew Scriptures? It's astonishing. So you read through a commentary there, and they'll say this is a, a present active participle of uh, this for uh, whatever... Mm, this is a passive verb, yeah. Uh, this noun is in the accusative, or in the genitive, or the nominative, or whatever. Um, interesting. Um, in the Greek text, the endings show you which these things are. But if we don't, if we don't think that text reliable, why on earth are we trying to to grammatically analyse it? You see the point there? Uh, so, so they're actually kind of 
they're contradicting their own statements about the inaccuracy of the Bible by trying to precisely get to the very nuance of what the Greek is saying. Everybody got that? Okay, that's always important to, to say that. So, okay, so... Uh, okay, so... If it's lost, who lost it? We talked about that earlier. Um, no one's seen an errant or inerrant manuscript today, living alive today. We accept by faith that God has preserved the text and so on. Uh, this is a personal statement of faith, very similar to what we read about earlier about believing uh, the things that are originally written there and so on. Uh, and uh, so, um, okay, uh, that's just uh, Dr. D.A. Waits' sort of information. It's other, there's lots of other people producing excellent material. Um, and then notes on the English, this final here, notes on the English of the authorised version here. Most often repeat the text of the order of that the these and the thous are outdated and difficult to understand. Uh, they do, however, give us a very accurate and helpful translated original text. We've seen from the following examples there. So, um, for instance, uh, <coughs> uh, it says about Peter, um, Satan that desired you, plural, the wise in the Greek are always plural, you, ye, yours, whatever, are always plural. The T's are always singular in the Greek. It's the only version that does that. Thee, thine, thy, and uh, thou. Yeah. Uh, so, um, they are always singular. So, in the Greek, it reads, um, Satan has desired you all, plural, but I pray for you, singular, Peter. Satan desired you, but I pray for thee. You see, so you'd never know that from the modern versions. You wouldn't know that. You see, so this is important theological, uh, this is important. Uh, theological uh, importance, not in the bread of scripture, but doctrine of the church, all kinds of things, and so we can get into that another time. But astonishing things here. So uh, we, we find these examples there, which is fascinating. Then we've got this, um, different, the old, old endings here. Uh, see, like, thou thinkest, he thinketh. It's just a second and third persons, that's all it is. Uh, the EST and the EST endings are verbs. Uh, they only not help, help us to identify the verb, so it also distinguishes the first, second, and third person. So I think, thou thinkest, he thinketh, so on. So how we say it today? I think, you think, they think, or whatever. But um, that's all it's saying uh, there. And um, uh, so, you know, it's... Um, Romans 14, some of us li some, none of us live it unto himself, and no man died unto himself. It, it gives the, the, uh, the, the whole context of, of, of bringing it up to make it real for us today. This is the, the uniqueness and the brilliance of, of, the, of the King James Bible. Uh, so we see these verb ends tell us that the living and dying are ongoing, continual processes, not a one time event. So use these ends also helps to experience events in the present rather than the impersonal past. And so. Then Jesus cometh, take your bread and give it them and flesh likewise and so on. Would, uh, it kind of makes that, you know, we're, we're into it, we're, we're there. You know, and this is a, a literary device that they, that they use. And so this is amazing. So, um, okay, uh, another criticism, the archaic words, and can they be taken in making such claims? Example, beret and betray have different meanings. Beret means to disclose or make visible, while betray means to turn over. So after a while came a day, stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of the for thy speech berayeth thee. All right? So it means disclose, it gives you away. Whereas it says in Matthew 26, 73, you know that after two days of the feast of Passover, the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. It means to turn over to somebody else. Both these words are in the King James. So they say, let us all be betrayed. But why did they choose betray here and beray there? Because they are talking about what's actually happening. There's a difference between these words. That's all. And so uh, the King James is incredibly accurate there uh, and uh, explanative there to, of, of what's going on. And he uses both these words. So it's not the question of archaic words, because it uses the modern word as well. And so on. So we find that with love and, and charity. Um, so, astonished and astonished, both are in the King James. So, astonished carries the idea of a person is so awed by some event or happening they are struck dumb and immobile, whereas astonished means to be extremely amazed. Example, uh, here, uh, love and charity are both translated from the same Greek word agape in the New Testament, 
uh, and simply reflect a choice by the translators to render the word according to the context of the passage. So, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 13, have not charity and so on, the King James Bibles, and few other times they translate it charity, most times they translate it love. Both are in the King James. So why do they say charity? Because they're, uh, they are trying to portray the outworking of love with charity, as opposed to the general concept you know, of, of love. There. So this is the practical, exp um, so they, they're using, these are correct translations, and they're using this in, in, in a good way. And so on. mostly it's love in the King James Bible. So why, why people say the archaic language? Because they, they include them both. And so it's just not, not a valid point. And then dissimulation and in hypocrisy. Actual fact, I've even, even the parliament just recently used the word dissimulation. English Parliament, uh, interesting enough, and they use a lot of these words. But uh, a dissembler is one who hides under a false appearance, whereas a hypocrite acts contrary to his words. So there's a, a little subtle difference here, and so both words are used in the King James, and so on, so astonishing. Now, uh, let me go back to the top one. They're astonished. Belshazzar saw the hand writing on the wall. It was astonished, transfixed. He could move. Um, and then uh, elsewhere, Christ was amazed, or we find someone was astonished about these things or whatever. But there's a difference between sort of abject fear uh, and astonished and, and astonished, amazed, and so on. So, so the King James brings out these wonderful uh, nuances there that really bring the passage into context and bring it alive. And it's so important that we, we recognize that. And so, um, uh, uh, contemned and condemned. Uh, both in the King James, and not exact equivalents. Uh, so, um, uh, contemn means to hold in contempt, whereas condemn means to judge or pronounce guilty. So, wherefore doth the wicked contemn God, hold him in contempt, not judging him guilty? He said his heart thou would require it from. Then, whose eyes a vile person is contemned uh, there? as opposed to a good man to take it from the but a man of wicked devices will condemn, he'll condemn others. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, uh, and so on. So uh, again, these are very important um, points here about the English of, of, of the King James. So uh, just, um, uh, yeah, and sample and example and so on, plural versus singular and so on. So uh, both in the King James and so on. So, um, okay, that's that one. Criticisms, any objections, any uh, vilifications? Uh. <laughs>